Well, uh, well, it starts by calling me mayor, so that's good. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, what day is today? August 17th? Okay, shall we call to order the August 17th Planning and Zoning Commission meeting? Uh, Jane, could we start with roll call? Vice Chairman Goldberg. Here. Commissioner Teta. Here. Commissioner Kohler. Here. Commissioner Lukacs. Here. Commissioner Boone. Here. Vice Chairman, you have a quorum. Thanks, Jane. Um, I think next we'll uh, look for communications from our Planning Director, Glenn Van Nimwigen. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I don't have anything for you. Okay. Great. We'll just end the meeting now. And <laughs> um, okay, great. Uh, next, um, okay. So for the next section, I'd like to open up the um, open up the microphone for public invited to be heard. These are for issues that are not relating to anything on today's agenda. This is your opportunity to come on up, address the commission, speak for five minutes uh, about anything not on the uh, agenda today. Uh, if you are interested in speaking on any agenda item today, there'll be an opportunity later in the meeting to do that. So um, I have Jane looking to see if you've signed up. And it looks like we might have uh, one or two folks that have signed up. Uh, so we'll call you to the front. Please st uh, state your first and last name and your address, and you get five minutes. Jane's in control of the clock, and uh, we'll let you know when you're out of time. Okay. So I think we'll start with Scott Stewart. Thank you very much. Um, commissioners, is that appropriate? Um, Scott Stewart, 229 Grant Street. Um, I'm actually here to uh, trying to gain some knowledge. Uh, there's a business at 1283 3rd Avenue. It is uh, located in within a residential zoned area. This business operates with a historical use exemption. Um, the issue that I would like to try to resolve here is that the uh, the business's capacity in relationship to its parking, um, it, it doesn't meet the demand of its patrons. Um, and in turn, it's turned kind of our neighborhood into a parking lot for a bar. Um, the historical use of the property is not in line with the current use. Um, the seating capacity of the current uh, establishment is far greater than uh, what was there historically. Um, I'm not able to re uh, retrieve um, uh, requested information about the exemption. I'm actually just looking for, you know, what was approved, how was it approved, when was it approved, and how did it reference the historical nature of the property. Um, kind of to sum things up, I'm looking for how do we get to this point that this residentially zoned neighborhood is being used as a parking lot for this business located in a residentially zoned part of town. Um, I'm not opposed to the business, but the size of the business is far greater than what was ever there. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. Thanks. <clears throat> Unfortunately, there isn't um, kind of back and forth on, on this uh, part of the meeting. Uh, but thank you. We've heard you. Uh, looks like the next one is Aaron Angel. Is, did I get that right? Aaron Angel? Aaron, would you please remember to come on up during the next section of Public Invited to be Heard when we're covering your agenda item? Cool. Okay, that's everyone on the list here. If um, you didn't put your name on the list and would like to address the commission, now would be the time if it's for an item not on the agenda tonight. Okay, let's go ahead and end uh, Public Invited to be Heard. I think next up on the agenda is approval of the minutes. We're looking to approve the minutes from last month's uh, Planning and Zoning Commission meeting. That's the June 22nd meeting. Do we have any motions? Uh, 
Commissioner Polo? Uh, as I think I might have been the only one here, I'll make a motion to approve the minutes. Uh, okay, we have a motion to approve the minutes. Um, I think I can second it if there's no one else. Seat 11 is no one. Um, forgive me, Jane, do we have enough folks on the panel to approve the minutes if only a few were there? Uh, Vice Chairman, uh, sorry, Goldberg. Um, you know, I had spoke with uh, City Attorney May before the meeting, this last meeting, and it is our understanding that even if you weren't at the meeting, you can still vote to approve the contents of the meeting minutes, so you don't have to abstain. If you've read the minutes and you agree with the actions in the minutes, you can still vote to approve them. Okay, so I think the, there's a motion on the table um, by Commissioner Kohler to uh, approve. Um, I'll second that, and I guess maybe we need to take a vote, Jane. Vice Chairman Goldberg. Um, aye. Commissioner Tedda. Abstain. Commissioner Kohler. Aye. Commissioner Lukacs. Approve. Commissioner Boone. Approve. Vice Chairman, that passes uh, four to one. Thank you, Jane. Okay, I think that uh, wraps up agenda item number five, uh, number six. Uh, now we'll move on to uh, our actual public hearings here. And so uh, stay tuned for the agenda item that's most important to you. Uh, beginning with the Quail Commercial Center Lot 3 Conditional Use Site Plan. Uh, maybe I'll start with staff. Thanks. Everybody hear me? Good evening. Uh, Vice Chair, members of the Commission, my name is Zach Blazik. I'm the Environmental Sustainability Planner here with the City. Uh, here before you this evening to present on the Quail Commercial Center Lot 3 Conditional Use Site Plan. So the project is proposed at the property located at the northeast corner of Main Street and Quail Road, down by the museum and the rec center. It's a 2.72 acre parcel with mixed use corridor zoning, and currently the property is vacant. The project would include the construction of two new mixed-use commercial office buildings adjacent to Main Street, just to the east, and the, the construction of one additional mixed-use commercial office building that would also include a drive through restaurant. That's the portion that makes this a conditional use today and why we're here. What we have on this slide is an example of the building elevations for the buildings that would go against Main Street. And what we have here is an example of the building elevation as it would face Quail Road with that drive through. The category that falls into that conditional use is restaurant with drive through. The use can be permitted by this conditional use review in the mixed use corridor zone district on a property adjacent to Main Street. That's kind of why we're here this evening. It has that use specific standard. Um, with that, it's been subject to the review criteria in section 1502055, which is for all application types. In our review, staff found that the project meets the land development code requirements for a conditional use site plan in the mixed use corridor zone. We looked at things like maximum height, building design standards, exterior lighting, circulation, and pedestrian linkage. In with this application, there are also two requests for administrative modification. Now, typically with one of these, if it were just a regular minor development review application, we would have Glenn sign off on it. But since it's a conditional use, we have you to make the final decision. With these modification requests, uh, we have a maximum building setback. The standard is 25 feet. The request is coming at 28 and a half feet. The other one we have is a landscape buffer. The standard is 20 feet and they're requesting a 10 and a half foot. Um, since this is an infill redevelopment site, these aren't necessarily subject to the same standards that like a variance would be subject to. Uh, we can come in and review these under that administrative process and have them subject to those standards in 1503080B. Thanks. Community engagement. We had a neighborhood meeting uh, back in the virtual times, November 16th of 2020. There were 15 attendees. 
Um, when the project came in, we notified a whole host of referral agencies and heard back from Excel and Parks and Wildlife with general comments. Uh, when the application came in in February of 2021, uh, we sent out notices and received a whole bunch of comments. The majority of these were related to an additional previous part of this application that included a hotel. In a following submittal, that hotel was withdrawn by the applicant and is not up for consideration today. So we don't have to worry about it. Uh, and the, the end of last month, I sent out notices of public hearing and did not receive any feedback from the public. So tonight you have the option to either approve the Quail Commercial Center Lot 3 Conditional Use Site Plan and Minor Modifications, finding the review criteria have been met. You can approve the CUSP and Minor Mods uh, with conditions, or you can deny the Quail Commercial Lot 3 Conditional Use Site Plan. Staff is making the recommendation that you uh, uh, conditionally approve Quail Commercial Center Lot 3 Conditional Use Site Plan and Minor Modifications with the conditions that the applicant will comply with all city requirements for a major prairie dog removal permit because there are prairie dogs on the property at this time. That would include relocating uh, or potentially include relocating all those prairie dogs to improve property and going through that process. That's everything that I have. Uh, next we can call up Rosie and applicant team to share their side. And you can just click through, guys. Thanks. Um, good evening, commissioners. Um, I'm Rosie Dennett. I reside at 210 Lincoln Street here in Longmont. Um, also with me tonight, I'm the planning consultant. Also with me tonight is Bill Novel, um, the applicant representative for MNR LLC, the owner. Um, and then Tom Moore, the architect on the project. So Tom's going to walk you through um, the site plan highlighting design standards and how we came up with the layout um, and then also touch on the two minor modifications that Zach mentioned. Um, and then I'm going to review the approval criteria with you. And then, of course, we're all available to answer questions. So you want to start? Commissioners, my name is Tom Moore. I reside at 1303 Longs Peak here in Longmont. It is a pleasure to be here and presenting this project. I will tell you that I'm about to show you a little video. It's an older video that used to include a hotel project, so it's been redacted just a little bit for your viewing tonight. But it, it did capture some of the, um, I think, some of the great elements about this project design and so I want to I want to show you this video and I think I can start it this at the outset of the design the importance of maintaining the mountain views from the Longmont Museum and the Recreation Center was understood we began by modeling the site buildings and the views toward the west the Colorado Front Range this mixed-use commercial center is envisioned to include retail, professional and business services, and residential uses. In stark contrast to much of today's commercial architecture, the Quail Commercial Center comes with a simple palette of materials and enduring design forms to create a village-like setting. Along Main Street and Quail Road are one- and two-story commercial buildings scale to complement the nearby residential neighborhood. The new commercial center creates a vibrant edge of buildings that frame views of the museum and recreation center and invite pedestrians to enter and engage the project. The design of the Quail Commercial Center provides a mixture of buildings and uses that will encourage citizens to come and enjoy this significant location. The project is responsive to the community context, including the Museum and Recreation Center to the east, the left-hand greenway to the north, and the residential neighborhoods to the south. Most importantly, this project supports and enhances the city's original master plan for this development, including circulation patterns, screened parking, and views of the city facilities from Main Street. the Quail Commercial Center. That was a, a 
project or a video that we created several years ago, which, which did at one time include more about the hotel. We are not doing a hotel in this project. This is now uh, focused on lot three, which we're, which is, we're creating right now in this process of the conditional use site plan. Um, I wanted to talk about a little bit about the design of our site. Um, I think we mentioned it that we're trying to create a really beautiful edge to this property as it's adjacent to Main Street and to Quail. Again, we picked materials and forms that had a, a, a scale that was approachable, uh, something that was beautiful, uh, materials that are enduring. Uh, part of our site design was to make sure we contained all of our parking away from the views of the streets, of the streets and especially away from the views of the adjacent residences to the south and any of the businesses to the, to the west. Uh, it's been, a, it's been a project that's been ongoing in my office. We've done a lot of work with regard to site design and making sure the, the drainage is, is handled appropriately. We're pleased to be at this point where we have everything approved except for these minor uh, modifications that we're here in front of you to discuss. Some of the things that, that we wanna talk about, I wanna show you uh, the site landscape plan. Uh, the landscape plan, it, really is, is one of our, uh, our focuses because we are doing every bit of landscaping required for this project um, in spite of not providing all of the depth of buffer that's required. All the materials required will be on site. And I wanna go over some of those um, uh, modifications that we're talking about. Um, but we're real pleased to be um, part of this corner. Um, let me, I think I can go back. Um, what we're talking about in terms of, we're talking about two things, two modifications. We have the requirement that from the property line to, to the parking lot, we are supposed to have 25 feet of landscape buffer. In this particular layout, this, at the smallest point, which I believe is right here, we have 10 foot seven. Other places were up, I think we're. And then over here, I think we're still a little bit more yet. So while we talk about being 10 feet as the minimum, we're, we're really, that is the minimum in a very small space. However, what we did make sure we provided was from the curb to every curb, we do have 25 feet of landscape that is also in the right of way. So we are providing 25 feet of, of landscape space. We are using some of that landscaped area that would normally be in the, that is in the right of way to get, to get the landscaped area we really like. And let me emphasize that we did not reduce any of the material requirements. The landscape plan I showed you accommodated everything that's required as far as the material for an arterial or, or for the, um, the streets and for the landscape buffering of a parking lot. So we're, we're real pleased about that. The other thing about the setback, um, maximum setbacks is new since we did this, started this project many years ago. So this particular site, when we were working with Public Works, we do have quite a bit of infrastructure planned in here as far as electric utilities. And when we looked at trying to move the building um, further east, to meet that requirement, it really conflicted with what we've really already worked out in great detail with uh, public works and especially with the electric department. The, um, and then we really do like the fact that it is a little bit further off the, off the drive anyway. Um, I'm gonna have to try to understand maximum setbacks like that, uh, but right now I think what we're proposing is still a beautiful solution to having a building um, while we are asking for a modification to that setback, it still is an appropriate, uh, appropriate view and an appropriate place to do that. Um, are there any questions for me right now before I turn it over to Rosie as far as the design? Okay. Rosie's going to talk more about our review criteria. Thank you very much. Okay, um, Rosie Dennett again. 
Um, regarding the approval criteria stated in your code, we've listed them here in really nice big print that no one can read. Sorry about that. <laughs> but they are in your packets also. Um, Obviously, we agree with staff's assessment that we are in compliance with the approval criteria. Um, specifically, um, this infill project is consistent um, with the comprehensive plan by providing a mix of land uses um, that contribute to the balance of residential, employment, retail, commercial, and recreational uses in the Quill neighborhood. We're surrounded by a, a wide variety of uses, as you know, if you've been by the site. Um, we're talking about um, being compatible with um, commercial to the west, commercial to the north, as well as the greenway along the um, stream corridor. We have the museum and um, the rec center to the east, and then we have residential to the south. So it's always a challenge with infill projects to be able to create something that will fit, that you can drop in and still be compatible and be a nice transition. Um, the proposed buildings and uses are the same as were included in the previously approved preliminary plat. Um, it was probably a different planning commission than the one we have now because it was a few years back. Um, but um, these uses that we're proposing today and the buildings are all the same, even the drive up window for the restaurant. Um, the proposed low profile of the building. Um, the building uh, does provide that tr transition area, we believe, uh, that nice transition from the residential to the south um, up to the commercial areas to the west and to the north. Um, the wildlife species and habitat report provided by um, our local uh, wildlife biologist, Jerry Powell, um, indicates that no habitat exists on lot three for any federally protected wildlife species. Um, prior to commencement of construction, we will um, have to comply with any um, applicable prairie dog removal requirements, as Zach mentioned. Uh, let's see, the traffic study um, indicates that the traffic generated from the proposed uses can be handled by the existing street system. Recommended improvements are fairly minor. Um, they include removal of a portion of the existing median that is now in Quail Road so that we can have room for the turn to Kimbark. And then repainting of some of the lane lines on um, Main Street or the highway um, to add turn lanes. Uh, multiple modes of transportation will have access to this site. We have an RTD bus stop um, at the corner of Quail and, to it and Main Street. Um, we have designed uh, the pedestrian walkways around the perimeter of the site. Uh, and we are, of course, providing the required bike racks at the buildings. Um, the proposal also meets the additional review criteria that you have in your code for secondary uses for a restaurant with a drive through window. Uh, the drive-through will be well screened um, from the public on Quail Road with landscape berming, plant materials, and a structural trellis screen. Um, the project also meets the modification approval criteria. So regarding the 25-foot required buffer area, as Tom was describing, um, we are providing the required plant materials and we are providing them within a 25 foot wide pervious surface area that's between curb to curb. The other modification, um, allowing several feet farther back from Ken Bark than um, what the requirement states is to accommodate the necessary improvements. So in conclusion, um, we have no objections to staff's recommendation of approval. Um, the one recommended condition that Zach mentioned regarding prairie dogs, we believe we'd have to be, we'd have to meet that requirement anyway, uh, whether it was in this um, condition or not, so we don't have a problem with that. Um, and we'd be glad to answer any questions that you might have. Uh, thank you. Um, okay. Let me just... Check the commission real quick. Any immediate questions before we go to public invited to be heard? Or shall we hear from them first? Everyone's good with that? Great. Then I think at this moment, I'd like to open up public invited to be heard for this agenda item, uh, the Quail Commercial Center. 
Um, excuse me while Jane uh, grabs the paper with the names. Uh, so again, this is your opportunity to speak to this agenda item. You'll have five minutes. Please say your first and last name and your address, and we'll go right through it. If you didn't sign up in advance, uh, when we get through the list, feel free to come on down and we'll, we'll uh, let you speak as well. Thanks, Jane. Okay, uh, the first and only name I have uh, signed up is Claudia Bayliss. Hey, Claudia, are you interested in coming down and speaking? Hi, uh, I live in the Blue Vista community. I'm sorry, one moment. Would you just pull the mic a little closer to yourself? Say your first and last name and okay. your address. Claudia, can you hear that? Claudia Bayless. Um, I, you want my whole address? Yes, uh, please. 237 Cardinal Way. I live in the Blue Vista community on the south side of uh, Quail. Um, I went to a meeting, but I can't remember. It was, I think, maybe pre-pandemic because the uh, hotel was still on the drawing boards. And at that time, there was another woman through my community, and there was a woman across um, uh, 287, and she's a, a teacher, and she actually in, teaches environmental stuff, and she walks a long time. A lot of times, she walks by the creek and everything. And so she was concerned about wildlife that doesn't have to be on an endangered list for you to, you know, be interested in their welfare. But the reason that uh, uh, I came to that meeting and came to tonight's meeting is my concerns about traffic, because we've already had fatal accidents at the corner of Quail and 287. Um, in fact, I was actually at that corner a few cars back uh, when they were all stopped in the ambulance, and I discovered the next day that a driver had been killed. Um, so what, what I was concerned about was the fact that this um, entrance and exit is going to be onto Quail, okay? And you say you're going to take away part of the boulevard there to accommodate that. But we've already got buses, and, uh, um, you know, it's not like it's a four-lane <laughs> highway or anything. So I'm real, I am really concerned, especially when they come. I've had people almost hit me anyway because they, they um, don't like when they're coming north to wait for the, the person who actually has the right way, you know, to turn uh, um, on the, the south going left-hand turn lane and they're coming north and they're going to turn right. And they, I mean, I almost got hit once. So um, they already act crazy on quail. They race on quail at night. You can hear them gunning their cars. So I'm just concerned about how this is going to be in terms of uh, just what I've noticed living there for, let's see, is it eight or eight, eight plus years? Um, and maybe other people aren't, but I, I, I am. You've got people getting on and off the bus. Uh, a lot of times people don't wait for the bus. Uh, you know, they want to pass it. I've just noticed the behavior there. So I'm a little concerned that we're going to have that, all of that added to what's already happening on Quail. That's all I want to say. I know it took me a while. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Ms. Bayless. Is there anyone else that didn't sign up that would like to come down and address the commission? Please come down. My name is Erin Angel, and I live at 1304 South Terry Street. In fact, you could see my house on that map. It was kind of cool. I'm right behind Brandon Iron Liquors. Very conveniently located. Um, I don't really speak this language very well, but I'm really not stoked about this development. I spend a lot more time than probably anybody 
in the city, except for the people that call that area home, as in they actually have their tent set up there and live there. I actually spend quite a bit of time on that land. And I happen to know that that land is inhabited. Um, Zach said it was vacant, it's not vacant. There are a lot of things that live there that don't get to vote and don't get to pay taxes. And so we don't really pay attention to them very much. I'm gonna get into that in a little bit later, but I'd like to echo what Claudia said. The traffic is crazy. The traffic on 287 is crazy right there. And putting in a drive through restaurant where we have so many children with the rec center and the museum and the innovation center and so many pedestrians, putting in a drive through restaurant is crazy. It is not gonna be safe. We don't need another drive through restaurant. I know people don't care about that because I, like I've heard, you know, when you talk about planning and zoning, what we need and what the owner gets to do don't always line up, but we don't need another drive through restaurant here. We're all fighting obesity as it is. And Longmont declared a climate emergency, but we're putting in and we're approving drive through restaurants. The addition and the carbon with that is, is huge. We shouldn't have drive through restaurants being approved anymore. We just need to stop it. We can do this. You can say no. It's your power. You've got that power. But I'm going to go into the things that live there. And I've actually addressed this with city council. I sent staff, Marsha Martin said, oh, the wildlife biologist didn't find it. Well, the wildlife biologist doesn't spend that much time there. I track. I teach tracking. I teach um, wildlife. Uh, I'm the one that Claudia is talking about. I teach wildlife identification. There's tiger salamanders there. I've had them. I've actually moved them because I was going to accidentally squish them. Um, I teach children in that area for the Longmont Museum. I'm there from 5 a.m. till 9 p.m. a lot. So in the Boulder County Endangered and Threatened Species or Species of Concern list, right there we've had garter snakes from that list. We have tiger salamanders. We have woodhouses, toads. We also have um, a vernal pond there that has unidentified, because I couldn't identify the tadpoles, but they're definitely not bullfrog tadpoles, unidentified. And as we know, all amphibians in this area are in peril of extinction. We also have gray fox. I had a teen volunteer so see a gray fox and her kits this uh, one morning cruising through. I also ran into a mink this big in the creek right there. I couldn't even believe. I just didn't even understand that how, how a mink could that be that big. But there's a mink in that creek. And then the next year, I found another mink and its mate during mating season right in that area. So there are inhabitants in the area. And people think about endangered species like polar bears and elephants, and they think that it's something someplace else. But we have the most endangered species in the world right here, and every piece of development messes with its habitat or the possibility of it coming back, and that's the black-footed ferret. We also have the burrowing owl. Where you have prairie dogs is supposed to be the habit for that, habitat for that. It is inhabited. And so every time we approve more development like this, this is what happens. So I, have, I, I am quite sure that people will just go ahead and improve more development and this kind of thing. But it is on you. And it is on us to protect it. So I have to speak up. Otherwise, I can't live with seeing all those things go away, seeing the prairie dogs that I say hi to every morning as I walk past them. I just can't live with myself with it. And we have to think, do we actually need another drive through Do we need another vacant office building? I mean, all our office buildings have these big vacancies in them. Do we need more development? Does it need to be done now? Can we give these species a little bit longer to live? And can we just chill and just stop building up so much? So that's, that's my two cents on this. Um, it's not vacant. It's there. And I hope that when this get built, it gets built, at least there's no drive through and at least the landscaping is not landscaping. Can we just have it be pocket prairie, at least for the pollinators? Thanks. Thanks, Miss Angel. 
Was there anyone else who would like to address the commission tonight before we proceed? Okay, then I'll go ahead and close the uh, public invited to be heard section um, of our discussion here. Uh, so from here, we'll go on to uh, discussion with the commission. Um, so commissioners, I'll open up the floor here. Let's start with Commissioner Lakachi. Lakachi. Thank you, uh, Vice Chairman Golden, Goldberg. Sorry. <laughs> um, I would like to open up the discussion about uh, traffic. We heard a lot from the public, and um, I noticed that the traffic study is, is impressive, you know, 200 pages. <laughs> Uh, I don't know who has time to go through every page and look at it. Uh, so um, my first question about the the traffic is um, uh, I noticed in one of those charts that um, the intersection of uh, 119 and 287 might reach the grade E in, in 2040, or it's already at PM, it's already E. Uh, so we assume in 2040 is going to be even higher. Um, what what are the mitigations that uh, we're going to do about it, and how are we going to uh, intervene? I don't know who can speak about that from um, from the applicant or we have uh, Mr. Angstead, our director of engineering. I'm sure would love to. Describe the plans. Good evening, uh, Chair Poland, um, board members, Jim Angstadt, Director of Engineering Services. Um, so, um, yes, they had a, a very extravagant traffic study for this development um, and noted that. Uh, I believe at 2040, 2041, that uh, the intersection of 119 and um, 287 operates at a level of service E. Um, I, I, uh, so what we're looking is A, B. <laughs> yeah, you know, it, it, levels of service are, 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 is how we designate kind of intersections. A is, is the best. Uh, no improvements would be necessary. B, and then go to B, C, D, and E. Um, so, so, it's important to note that both the uh, Main Street Corridor 287 and, and 119 Corridor operate on an adaptive traffic signal system. Um, and both of those corridors are C dot. Uh, sorry, oh, I should speak into the mic a little better. Um, both of those corridors are C dot owned um, and uh, um, maintained corridors, although the city does have contracts with C dot for maintenance of traffic signals. Um, CDOT has recently done um, improvements on 287 for safety improvements uh, just south of the um, 119 um, corridor. But at this time, the, the city, we're, we're mostly focusing on safety improvements for intersections, um, not necessarily looking at capacity. Uh, there's really not a lot of abilities to widen out the roadways either of those intersections. And those, whether this project moves forward or not, those intersect that intersection will continue to be uh, problematic. And, and does CDOT receive these um, traffic studies that we do internally, you know, for, for the city development? Um, I believe in this case they would because this, the applicant will be required to obtain a CDOT permit for their access onto 287. Okay. And, and speaking about safety, um, what about the crashes that happened uh, in the past there uh, at Quail and uh, 287 that we heard from our 
community member. Do you do you have a report or crash? Data? So every every I want to say every fall, September, October time frame, the city issues uh, a crash report. Um, we take the, the the data from the previous year, incorporate it into a five or ten year um, time frame of analysis, and look at uh, critical intersections in the city whether they are um, signalized at a certain, whether they're arterials, whether they're collectors, uh, certain levels, intersections. Um, and then we use that information to compile future uh, capital improvement programs and safety improvements. So um, if there's, you know, if we look, if we see that there's a, there are intersections where there are trends, increasing accidents, we, we program that into our future CIPs to address however, um, you know, whatever those, uh, um, to address those issues. One thing to note that a lot of accidents we see when there's fatalities involved, there are not improvements that could be done. We see a lot of distracted drivers, a lot of, a lot of uh, alcohol and, and drug related accidents um, and or accidents with people just on their cell phones. So some of those, there's not really a lot you can do to, to fix your, your, uh, your transportation system. But go back to your original question, we do uh, undertake a, a crash analysis every year. Uh, that will be coming out, uh, um, I, I think, in the near future. We usually uh, unveil it in the fall. And do you do anything um, in relating to speeding? Like I noticed even in the traffic study, uh, they measured the speeds of, of the cars that were uh, passing through. So there was an 80 miles an hour. Um, uh, are you looking at any improvements or are you taking that in consideration in your SCIPs in the future? So, um, yes, we do. Um, one of the components of things we look at in our traffic unit is um, if we get complaints, significant complaints, you know, more than more than three or four, we usually, we our process is we will go out and we'll do a speed study for a roadway. Um, that would, would uh, similar to what you see in the traffic report, um, over a 24-hour period, we will we put down a, um, a measuring device and we will measure both speed and number of vehicles. And then we will look at if it if it's above the criteria for uh, uh, what is in the manual uniform traffic control devices, we would then institute, we may institute, institute some improvements. Um, we have a revolving budget every year for those types of things. We also have a neighborhood mitigation program uh, designed for residential streets. Um, basically to exclude arterials and collectors. Arterials, you usually don't want to do any type of traffic calming. That's going to be an enforcement issue. Uh, but we do look at collectors. Um, improvements can be uh, flashing speed signs, um, speed tables, um, curb extensions. So we have a, a couple of items in our arsenal to, to address those. And, and we are we look at those on a regular basis. So that would be quail would be in uh, Yeah, and quail has, has a number of, of already a number of items of, of traffic uh, mitigation on them already. There's flashing speed signs. We've done some curb extensions already. Um, some of this falls in, you know, will we'll fall to enforcement on some of those roads. Okay, so if, if someone, if, if the neighbors would like to uh, look more into the traffic on quail, maybe file some more complaints, is that, is that right? Is that what I'm hearing? <laughs> Uh, I can give my number. They can call me. <laughs> we 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 uh, we have a um, they can they can contact the public works. Um, we have a, a call in center. Uh, they can contact us there, um, or they can contact our office directly. Okay, thank you. That that is all that I have for now. Thank you. I have a few more questions relating to traffic, but there's other members of the commission that. Um, have kind of raised, put their name in the queue. Does anyone else have any questions around the traffic specifically? Cool. Let's see if I can do this right. Uh, six. Commissioner Kohler. So I have some questions about uh, the development of the Kansas Avenue. Um, I guess it's not clear to me, it, it, it's not part of the application that that gets built out, um, but I'm wondering if if when it does get built out, if it uh, would alleviate some of the issues on Quail Road. And I don't know if that would be a city thing, like, you know, at what point that gets built out. Um, currently, the extension of Kansas is not in, in any of the city CIPs, um, capital improvement programs. So at this juncture, I, it would be beyond five years out. 
um, potentially could be when the, the, the area around the museum and uh, the, uh, the rec center develops further. Um, that would tie in. It could, could potentially be a bit of a reliever to Quail Road, but it, it really only extends to um, the street immediately to the, to the east. Um, so I, I couldn't say, you know, without further study what, and projections of traffic, whether that would actually be relieving Quail. Sorry. Uh, so, just a little follow up on that. Does does um is it is there? So the, the the only access to this parcel will be from Quail Road, right? There's nothing. The applicant has nothing proposed on the north to access the site. As I recall, there is an access um, Kansas Road. Kansas will will come off of two eighty seven, and then there's an access north south access. It comes off a of quail, so there will be two access points. Okay, so they you can develop you, they will develop Kansas at least to the point of their yes parcel. Yes. Okay, thanks. That's all. Okay. Would you mind reintroducing yourself? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sorry. used to I'm used to Tyler Stamey or another member of the team. Uh, Jim Angstadt, director Ang of engineering Stat. services. Thanks, thanks, Jim. I just hate not knowing your name. Jim, would you do us a favor and clarify the rating system? Um, I think it probably has to do with um, average wait times at lights and um, you know volume of traffic. But for myself and everyone else in the room, would you just clarify like what's an A versus what's an E? Without looking at the chart sure. off the top of my head, I would not be able to do that. But it is is a time based for for wait at an intersection, and A being the best and, and kind of free flow at a signalized intersection, and then it, it proceeds to down from B to C to, to D to E. Great. And is it measured all day, or is it only during peak hours? When is this intersection an E, which is the worst rating? Um, I'd have to look at the traffic study to see what the, the, the time frames are. Um, I'm, you know, my little experience with, with some of the traffic studies I've read, it's, it's usually they look at it as a, as a peak hour level will be what is the worst possible case you'll find. Um, and then on some, in some cases, in some studies, they will average out the, the, uh, the time frames for all directions to reach a certain level of service or whatever the level of service is. It is. In some cases, you may have uh, a left bound, um, you know, turning north two lanes of traffic, and then that may operate at a level of service D, which everything else may be at, a, at an A, it'll drag down the, the overall level of service. So it is, it is an average of all movements at the intersection. Okay, so is it safe to assume that this intersection is probably during the morning commute and during the evening commute when it's at its worst level? That's when you're gonna see it, yes. Do we know what it is the rest of the time? Sometimes we see Bs turn into Ds you know, during the peak hours, yeah, you know, I, I, do, you, do you have any experience with this or is there someone here more than, that more can than likely better address this it would, it would probably be down to a level of service or up to a level of service D. It wouldn't change significantly for the amount of traffic that travels on those two roadways. Okay. And then sometimes like the specifics are, you know, have been, you know, enlightening to me. So like, I think the rating can be if you the average wait time is 30 seconds that might make go from an A to a B or 60 seconds waiting for your turn might be a B to a C. Is that a little bit? Is that the spirit of the rating system, or can you give us a just a some context? Are we waiting for 45 minutes to make that turn? You know, during an E, like it's going to be in, it's going to be in seconds. And, and again, with, with the adaptive traffic signal systems that are able to, to make corrections as you move blocks of traffic, that will be able to, the, the signal systems are able to be adjusted and coordinated so that when there's less traffic, maybe on 119, they'll be able to move more traffic on, on 287. Okay. And is speeding or frequency of accidents taken into consideration when that intersection is rated? Not, not for the level of service ratings, no. So it's just the amount of time you're it sitting is, at the light is, waiting yes. to turn. Um, did you review this? Were you part of Zach's review team in when in making the recommendation to approve this project? Um, I was not part of it personally, but um, staff was. Okay. I don't know if I should maybe point my question then back at uh, Zach Blazer. Um, because my question is, 
Why do we have a review system, a rating system, if when we have an E, the worst rating, there's a proposal for development, and but it's still got the green light to go from, from staff. So could you just clarify whichever member is the rightest person? Give us some confidence in why was this approved despite it being in a poor rating? Why have the rating system at all? Is it one of our review criteria is a little bit? And I don't know that, that, that this, if I were to do an analysis with and without this project, I don't believe that this project will significantly impact that rating at that intersection. I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be a, a level of service E no matter what, what goes on in the community, whether this project is developed or not. Got it. So we should find confidence in the staff's recommendation to approve in this case, at least tra as it relates to traffic, because whether this project is built or not, it's not going to have a major impact on the existing traffic conditions. I don't believe so. While you were talking, uh, Don Burchette walked up. I don't know if you were going to mm -hmm. chime in or not, John. Chime in? <laughs> I'll let Don take Thanks. over. Thanks, Don. And thanks, Jim. Good evening, Chair Goldberg, members of the commission, Don Burchette, planning manager. Just as a little bit of background, when we annexed this property along with the uh, properties that include the Lowe's as well as the Best Buy, so Harvest Junction, North and South. This was all part of the Baker annexation, which this piece was an original part that was the last piece to be brought in when we annexed it. When this was brought in, the city council looked at the benchmarks for traffic at that time. This was back in the late 90s, early 2000s. It's probably 2002, I believe, is when I worked on this project. The city council granted an exception for this area because at that time we identified that the benchmarks were not met back in 2000 and we knew that with any development over time, the benchmark would continue not to be met. The concern and the issue that was raised was that there were no improvements that a single development could do to fix this problem. This is a system-wide, it is, as Jim talked about, something that would require most likely city and CDOT going in and acquiring a lot of property to try to, to fix. It's a regional intersection. We have people that are going from Fort Collins, Loveland, South. We have people out in the Tri-Towns that are going to Boulder and vice versa. So this was looked at and the council granted a variance for that intersection when that development was annexed in and brought in for, for development. So they identified the problem. We identified the problem back when I first started here a long time ago. Um, so that's just a little history for you to understand and why we have those. We still do the reports. We still want to understand the impacts. So we want to understand if we're negatively impacting any other areas where we should require turn lanes or ACL D-cell lanes to make sure that we handle that traffic appropriately and mitigate the problems that are being caused by development and have the development community that is causing that additional traffic and those needs for those improvements to fix those. But as I understand the study without going through it in detail, there was nothing identified other than what we have already shown with the development and the plat and the public improvement plans for the improvements on Quail Road and then Kansas Avenue and I believe that's Kimbark uh, that runs north and south through this development. But that's just a little history for you. Yeah, thanks, Don. Okay, Jimmy, I don't think I have any more traffic questions myself. And then I want to apologize to Commissioner Boone. She's been waiting patiently while I jumped in with that's my traffic fine. questions. No, that's fine. And that was appropriate. Um, thank you. Does that work? Um, my questions have to do with the setbacks and the landscape buffers. And um, it seems like both of these things relate a lot to this drive-through piece of the project. Um, my first question is the applicant pointed out that um, there is a, tw I think it's 25 feet curb to curb along 
Kimbark, um, which provides sort of a buffer. It's just that the landscaping would all be in the 10 foot six portion. Did I understand that correctly? And similarly over on Kansas. Um, and that the amount of landscaping required for a 20 foot buffer, and I think the requirement is a 20 foot buffer, not a 25 foot buffer, but the landscape required for a 20 foot buffer in terms of number of trees and shrubs and things would still be there, even though it was going to be in the 10 foot six portion. Is that, am I understanding that correctly? Yes, Commissioner Boone, all of that is correct. Okay, and then my second question has to do with um, the setback. And I think this is, I, this, is, this is a requirement that I'm not fully um, familiar with, and I think it's kind of new, and I'm wondering, Zach, if you can explain a maximum setback to everyone. Sure, so when you think of a setback, it's the distance between the property line and where the building would be required to be, right? Which so is usually a minimum setback. Usually it's a minimum, so it would be a minimum. You have to be at least 10 feet away from the property line, for mm -hmm. example. This is kind of the opposite. So you have to be within 25 feet of this property line, between the property line and the edge of your building. 25 feet, if you meet the standard, is as far back from the property line as the edge of the building can be. Does that make sense? It, it does make sense by definition, and I'm wanting to understand the reason behind it so that I could get my head around giving a variance for it. Sure, so when you think of the mixed use corridor zone district, you think of shopping, retail, um, and here on Main Street, one thing that we're really trying to focus on with our Main Street corridor plan and with future land use planning in general is creating walkable spaces, pedestrian friendly, and a character that is kind of similar to that of our downtown. So when you think of walking up and down Main Street in our downtown, the buildings are right there. You have your walkable space, you have your trees, and then you have the street. It's trying to create a similar type of um, form in that respect, and that's why we have the maximum rather than the minimum. Okay, understood. It seems like it's not real applicable to... Um, it's a long-term strategy. Yeah. Well, it's well, it, it's not too applicable to this particular project on the east side. I would agree. It's that's a it's a different situation. Um, okay. And then my third question um, is probably for the applicant. Um, was there any consideration given? And I know this is not what the commission is supposed to be looking at tonight. But was there any consideration given to a non-drive-through? little restaurant, little coffee shop on that corner, which con considering that you're right by, you know, the library and the rec center in a very walkable residential neighborhood um, seems much more friendly than a drive through Thank you. Commissioner Boone, I'd like to respond to that. This project has been in the developments for almost 15 years. And originally, we did have a hotel on site. The brand of hotel does not have a restaurant. And so at that point, we believed what we needed to provide for that particular use adjacent to our property was a mix of the ability to have formal, formal restaurants, because we have another restaurant potential in one, of the, in one of the buildings along Main Street, but also something more casual. And, and in the neighborhood meetings that we had, there was also a desire for some more casual sort of coffee shop type places. One of the things that in terms of marketing for those kinds of users, um, we needed to have this option. Um, it's sort of market driven. We wanted to do everything we could to make it le the least impactful to the environment. And we, I think we succeeded in that. But the idea was we're providing the potential for anybody, for, for other uses like a, like could be a, I, I've been thinking coffee shop, uh, quite frankly, but uh, it could be a restaurant that's more of a, of a um, s smaller scale in terms of what they're, what they're doing. It's not, a, obviously it's not a big box or a, a franchise type restaurant, but 
the the idea of being able to market this site with a drive through was very important into the development community that was going to be looking at what could what could be built here what could we what could we buy and what could we produce here Commissioner Teta? Great, thank you. Okay, I have a couple questions for either uh, Planning Director Van Nimwegen or uh, uh, Zach. Uh, there was an article in today's paper about uh, the study session last night and the uh, um, probable eventual elimination of drive-throughs in the mixed-use corridor and on Main Street or adjacent to Main Street specifically. Could either of you speak to why we would look to eliminate drive-throughs and um, what it is about drive-throughs that maybe, I guess my concern is uh, that maybe we'd be a little bit behind the trend um, right now. Yeah, actually, uh, Zach uh, presented that last night, and the goal is um, from our um, Main Street Corridor study, and the idea is just to uh, create a better atmosphere for more pedestrian um, trips, and that means fewer car trips. So that is the goal. Um, I don't think we're at this point eliminating them. We uh, are trying to maybe move them off Main Street so we can you know, ultimately have a more walkable main street. Um, but in the meantime, um, they will be like conditional uses on other places on the site. So that's the goal from the plan, which I think was adopted 2018. So yes, it's taken us a while to bring it forward, but that's the goal. Thank you, Vice Chair Goldberg. Um, Drive-throughs, um, there was just a mention uh, a couple of moments ago that the applicant wanted something casual, and I don't see drive-throughs as something casual. They're fast, right? You're just in and out, and there's no casual chatting, connecting to your neighbor, connecting to a friend over a coffee or something. And and when I was looking at the, the plans and the attachments we received, um, it was mentioning a coffee place. So uh, now we're talking about a restaurant um, and eliminating drive-throughs as, um, as a vision. Um, what other drive-throughs are uh, on Main Street in that area? Like I, I know of two of them already. So this would be a third one at that intersection from what I know. Um, would you be able to, to speak about that? Um, how many are 
around there and um, in, in why would we approve another one? <laughs> Ziggy's and there's the, the liquor store has a drive through. I'm, unf I'm unfamiliar with that liquor store. I'm sorry. Is that the liquor store at Main and Second or? No. no. The liquor store right directly across that was on that map. It's Brandon Iron Liquors, right? right it's it's garage, next to Gondolier, yes. Okay. I'm. <laughs> Unfamiliar. I've, I know about Ziggy's. I don't know about the liquor store. I would note that our drive through is not accessed off of Main Street or Quail. We are accessed off of the two new streets we're creating, which mm -hmm. is Kimbark and Kansas. And all of our stack space is within our parking lot. We will, if there's excess stacking space, then it does happen in the parking lot of the development. And I think that's an, I, not to challenge your opinion, but I think of Starbucks as a very casual place, mostly with a drive-through. And I think there could be, there are restaurants that would have a drive-through too, if they had the ability. I mean, I mean, I think of McDonald's, they have a drive-through. They're, that's casual to me. Um, but I don't think, it, I think the location we think is important because it does draw to, from a neighborhood and from a lot of community activities adjacent to our site. There's, there's no place to have a casual beverage uh, close by to the museum and to the uh, rec center at this point. So casual means sit down, not drive through. Um, <laughs> no, no, no. It's both. I think it's both. Can people walk through a drive through or No, are they allowed? that's not no, allowed. They're not. No. I guess we're, we're going to probably be splitting hairs on semantics, but when I think of casual, it's not something that you're going to book a reservation for you're going to be able to go there and maybe decide to go through the drive-through if you've got kids and you want to go through fast, or you can take the kids inside. But it's not um, it's not a it's not a sugar beet. It's not a it's not that kind of a restaurant. Now we have places for the sugar beet if they want to be down there, but this is this is something a little more casual. And what's the capacity inside? Uh, let me get my notes. I can't. Um, we have in that building, we have a 2,400 square foot space for the restaurant. That's the ground floor piece. We have a second floor for offices that's another uh, 1,600. So 2,400 square feet, that's not a big, that's not a big restaurant. Mm -hmm. Most restaurants are going to be at least double that. So I guess my, my question still stands, why would we approve a, a dr another drive-through in, in that area? And I don't know if anyone has the, <laughs> the answer, but uh, I'm still trying to figure it out. Well, it could be because it's good for business, and it's good for the business base in, in Longmont. That could be a reason. Okay. Maybe before you sit down, Mr. Moore. Yes. Is that right, Mr. Moore? Yes. Um, you mentioned that um, you were successful in creating an, uh, a restaurant experience or suggesting that it this was the mo most minimal impact to the environment. And the drive-through potentially was a part of that. Would you just share how you, what, what did you mean by that, that this was um, the approach that had the least impact on the environment? Could we, can I get the site plan up? Okay, um, this, is, this is the location of our restaurant. And again, one of the things that we wanted to do was to make sure we're not experiencing the kind of things, I, I have my office on Main Street and I know that there are days when I drive down by the Dutch Brothers Coffee that their, their drive-through lane is out in the middle. And then I've been to Fort Collins a lot where 
there's a particular chicken restaurant that just fills up the whole street um, college. So we were careful that if we're having a drive through, it's going to impact not, not the people who are not even wanting to be involved, but only the people engaged in the actual project in here. So both our parking and our approach to have a drive through is fully contained on site. This becomes a very important landscape buffer, and we did, I think as Rosie alluded to it, in our, in our plans that have been approved for screening that, we have, we have berms, landscaping, and a trellis element to screen vehicles that are parked in this lane right here. And again, we, we like the distance of the setback as people come out, and then they will be able to choose to go out either on the north end and, and access main from this north, or again, they can come out here and end up going any direction, east or west, uh, to the main street. The idea was that we were creating something that, again, had a visual, visually a little impact to the, especially to the residents right across the street here. Um, they do enjoy a, a, an outlot, a landscape outlot between the curb and their, their backyards, but we, we again, wanted to minimize the, the street, the impact of this kind of use uh, for their, where they're living. Did, did yeah. I answer that? Yes, thank you. Okay, I think I'll point my next question um, at Zach. Zach, by our third meeting together, I'll get your last name right, I promise. Um, Zach, this drive-through re requires approval, is a conditional approval, right? Or conditional use, meaning we got to approve it. This drive-through doesn't touch Main Street. You know, it's all done internal. What is the intention behind the drive-throughs being a conditional use, you know, condition requiring the additional approval? What is the intention behind that? And is this type of drive-through relevant? Sure, so the, the background of that is, um, you know, kind of going back to that discussion that we were just having about Main Street and about the Main Street corridor itself um, and the context of the uses that are directly against it, right? right? The way that the rule is written is it's any property or parcel that is directly adjacent to Main Street. So you alluded to the fact that this is not directly adjacent to Main Street. I'm assuming in the sense that there are buildings between it and Main Street itself, right? So the CUSP rule where we have to come in and have a public meeting still applies, right? Because it's on that parcel. Um, but I see what you're getting at, where does it apply? My answer is yes, because it's a parcel that's on Main Street. Um, but it's kind of up to you guys to decide what to do from there. <laughs> All right, Fair I, enough. I, I see you passing it off. I'll just add, uh, historically with drive-throughs, you have uh, menus and uh, speakers, so a lot of times that's why you get a chance to look at it and you get the opportunity for neighbors to weigh, on, weigh in on, on it for themselves, basically. Great, thanks, Glenn. Okay, all right, so now that we better understand the reasoning behind it, let's talk about what was in the paper today and what city council is reviewing. You know, so now, like, the intention of the law versus the vision, right? Or the intention of the code versus the vision. Um, what is this the section of 287 that city council is currently reviewing this no drive through, you know, moving forward policy? Sure, so two comments. Uh, to answer your first question, the, the current thing that is under review with council that I'll be bringing up in the future um, is for the entirety of Main Street in the Main Street corridor. Um, but I do want to point out that that hasn't been approved by council yet. And since these guys are currently under review under the current set of standards, that's the standard that we have to hold them to. Great. Would you mind clarifying what is the entirety of Main Street? Is that between 119 and 66? Does it include south of 119? What is that full the, the Main Street corridor is Plateau Road all the way to the south. Plateau on the south. Correct. To, to 66. Highway 66 to the north. Okay, including the section that we're reviewing right now. That's correct. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, 
Um, I'd like to address a comment then that Mrs. Angel made about a request to leave this less landscaped um, and more into a natural, you know, maybe grassland. Um, I guess I, maybe the question is for staff, and it, it, would that even be allowed under our current code? Thank you, Commissioner Kohler. Um, I believe the the comment from the public was to leave a portion of the land as completely natural, right? Um, that is not something that we would be able to permit with our landscape code. Uh, we do have a number of trees that are required. We have specific planting and groundscape requirements that, that we have to review and ensure are installed correctly. Um, so that's not something that we would be able to consider as staff. All right, Zach, just a couple quick hits uh, from our, the folks who spoke. Um, there's concerns about the existing animals there. Um, can you talk about what sort of animal studies were done and what were the results that are enabling, that was enabling you to recommend approval of this? Sure, so the, the big item that we request when we have any development review is a species and habitat conservation plan. Um, what that specifically looks at is plant species um, and any federally protected species, as well as raptors that are in the vicinity. Um, the, the main outcomes from the species and habitat plan that we reviewed for this project uh, were that there are A, prairie dogs on the property. There's a number of steps that you have to take going through the prairie dog mitigation process. Um, and our, our commenter did mention burrowing owls. That's one of the things that you have to go through a process in order to actually get to development on. Um, again, the, the species and habitat report for this project did not identify any federally protected species. Um, so that gives the kind of the major green light to approve as well as with any other conditions for environmental that need to be met. So if there's a nearby raptor nest, they have to mitigate for that appropriately. Some of that work happens after approval and prior to construction, um, you know, surveys and, and things like that. So for, for us, for staff, the, all of those hurdles were, were met in order to approve. Right, approval for you guys. I appreciate the clarification. And then the, um, the other item uh, Ms. Angel brought up was environmental impacts. Can you talk about what sort of environmental impact reporting or studies are required to be reviewed before a project like this can be approved? Again, that species and habitat conservation plan is the big one. Um, there, there was possibly also an environmental, uh, like a phase one environmental report that came in. I was not involved in that review um, at the time, so I can't necessarily speak to what that was. Um, but again, if there were major issues, they would have come up prior to us getting to this step. So I feel confident to make that recommendation of approval now. Okay, thank you, Zach. Commissioner Kohler. Yeah, I guess I have one more question on the on the hotel. So it was removed from the plan um, and replaced by the buildings that are proposed there now. Is that right? No. And I, and I wish I should have clarified that. Um, this particular site that you're looking at, the hotel is was to be over here. And it is adjacent, immediately adjacent to the corridor, the um, St. Brain corridor, the St. Brain Greenway, which I would suspect that's where we found other animals living. I don't think we found, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't know that the salamanders were over here on the no, corner. The salamanders were exactly right there. Exactly right there. Right. The Vernal Pond is right there. But the minks were. I haven't, I've walked the site several times, but not come across a pond or a... Yeah, it's a vernal pond, so you need to come across it in the spring. That's what that okay. is. So it's, it's a, it appears in the spring. There are young cottonwoods there. Now that's how you can locate it. The city is just, uh, the city wildlife biologists were just alerted to that because nobody had passed that on, and I didn't know how to do that before. Okay. Um, so that is only in the spring. 
Okay, thank you. thank you for the feedback. Forgive me, I'd really like to maintain a decorum here. So if we could please keep the, um, the, the feedback to be at the podium to the commission. This isn't a kind of back and forth with, this, with the public. Absolutely, Rosie Dennett again, uh, planning consultant um, on this project. The pond that, um, there aren't ponds on this lot the pond is on um, the lot adjacent to the um, museum um, and the rec center. It's to the north. Um, and then also the a few references that um, she made uh, regarding some of the wildlife along the stream. Um, this is lot three. Um, the hotel is on lot was on lot one which is to the north of this site, and there's also a second lot to the north of this site. Then you have uh, Left Hand Creek. So the stream corridor obviously is going to have more impact as far as um, wildlife movement and various um, issues there. And um, as part of the platting process, that was platted as a, uh, a greenway um, outlot that's going to the city. So that stream corridor is actually going to be owned by the city when the plat is recorded for this. But tonight, this is just lot three. Um, so it's just what you see there. And the hotel that was referenced before is on uh, lot one, was on lot one, which is to the north of this site. And that would have to go through a separate site plan review. And can you say again which lot's being given to the city? The out lot. The so. Do we have a larger, do we have the plat in any of our? Okay. This is a, the multimodal plan for the development. We're talking tonight about this site. This is the hotel site, or what was the hotel site. It is no longer a hotel site. And then this is lot one. This is lot two. This is all that's being given back to the city as far as part of the Greenway from this property owner. All of this space in here will become part of the St. Frank Greenway, which is part of this development application. So again, we're dealing with this site tonight. This is a future development opportunity, but we do not have it slated for anything at this point. We don't know what it's going to be. But it will not be a hotel by whatever, it won't be our hotel. It won't be the hotel of the developer, the original owner that wished to do that. So. That's the scope of the project. There's a great deal of space here that's being, that's going back to the city as part of this development application. And, and there's no trees being removed on this lot? No. There aren't okay. any trees on this lot. There aren't any trees on this lot. Okay. And um, just to comment, the final plat has already been approved by staff, so I think we're, we're, we're done with the platting process, but this is just the site plan review for lot three. So we apologize for not making that clear. Um, the other uses were on the other lots. Um, and lot four, you'll see a reference to lot four. Um, that is in the area, can I do it with this? Ha ha. That is this lot, which is also part of the plat. And that also goes to the city. So the, as part of the platting process, which if you'd been on planning commission a few years ago, <laughs> would, have, would have included the preliminary plat review. Um, but this um, portion of, of the land is currently owned by the city, and we're doing a land swap. 
with this piece and this piece. So the city will now become owners of this lot once we record the replat and the plat um, so that that can be used for parking and um, whatever other uses that they need for their campus, their quail campus. Um, so there, that's why there's a long history on this property. We've had a lot of negotiations back and forth with the city on this. Thank you, that helps. Okay, sure. Thank you. Am I on? Okay. Um, I have one more question for the applicant. Um, so currently you have this little drive through restaurant tucked back behind an office building on a side road. Um, what happens with the signage? Is that going to be on Main Street or is it going to be something huge that towers above the office portion? Or, or what? Thank you. Commissioner Boone, uh, we will be creating a master sign program for this project in the future. What we've shown in this development application is individual tenant signage op options for the commercial buildings. Um, we're not really talking at this point about signage because it's still up in the air as far as how what, what we're going to have. But it will comply with the requirements of the sign, the signage requirements with this with the development application that, for that signage. Okay. Thank you, mm -hmm. Mr. Moore. Before you sit down, I wonder if I could ask you one last question. You know. One of the things that I really appreciate from applicants is when they, you know, make a conscious effort and respond to the public and, you know, do their best to be kind of teammates with the community when they bring in a project. And I think you've demonstrated a few times here where you and your project have done that. And I applaud you for that. Um, in order to have a drive through, you needed a special approval from us. And which means that like there's already a little friction. And then in our city council, apparently since 2018, have been evaluating the role of drive-throughs on our main street corridor, uh, which includes the area of your project. Um, how important is this drive-through to you? You know, is it, will this break your project if you are unable to have the drive-through or could your project continue to bring needed housing to our town, provide the casual eatery that you're looking for, uh, and you know, kind of enhance our downtown district like you're intending to do? I feel like that's a double-edged sword type question, Commissioner Goldberg. Let me, let me, let me answer the, let, let me ask Zach something. Sure. I believe that the, the potential of in, improving pedestrian access, while it's important, it's very important, what, I'm, what I heard last night, and I attended the um, last night's meeting with, with the, with the uh, city council, what I heard, and correct me if I'm mistaken, is that the idea, the reason Main Street is being targeted to limit drive throughs and we're talking Main Street, we're not talking everywhere else, and we're not really, this drive through is not actually on Main Street. But the reason they want to do that is because the curb cuts involved in a drive through create unsafe environments. And you can, you can go to places on Main Street just north of 9th and Main. Um, I, I really like Dutch Brothers Coffee, but it's, a, it's, a, it's not a great place to walk. You have to keep watching because cars are going in and out on both sides. But the reality is, is that I think the intent is to create safe walkable spaces. I don't think our drive through impacts and creates an unsafe, unwalkable space. But I do know that a drive through option for a development is, is, is a big plus when you're out there in the marketplace. And I don't think in this location, I, I, would, I would like to say, no, we, we, we get by without it. But I think in this, in this case, 
this, this really is not a bad place to have one. And this particular project, I don't think flies in the face of what the city's saying they want to do. Um, that's, that's my opinion, but I, I, I want to know if they are, if they concur. Um, I, can, I, I can ask Zach if he concurs. Okay. <laughs> Zach, how do you, what's your read on um, the justification here? I mean, I would just circle back to staff did review the, the review criteria as it's been set at the time and, and found that the review criteria were met. Um, that's the standard and threshold that we have to reach to make our recommendation to you. So I would stick with it. Thanks, Zach. How about now, Commissioner Teta? How about now? No. Um, Thank you, Vice Chair. I, you know, I, I'm really sensitive to the need for walkability and connectivity. I don't feel like without development there in that part of town, there's much opportunity for walkability or um, pedestrian um, activity on that side of the street I, at all. I guess what I'm trying to say is I feel like it's got to get developed with connectivity in mind. Um, and if it doesn't, it's n not a place anybody's going to want to be walking anyway. So I'm, I'm in favor of this. I like this project. Commissioner Kohler. Yeah, I think I'd second that in that... Uh you know, there's some concerns brought up by the public. I think the applicant and the staff have done a good job of addressing those with the traffic. Um, and then also with the environmental concerns, I think the fact that this lot isn't currently losing any trees, that there is a buffer between it and the St. Vrain Greenway uh, makes me feel a little bit better about that. The condition that they'd have to survey for burrowing owls prior to construction um, Makes me feel better about that. So, and I, so I think I'm, I think I agree that the drive-through itself, because it is off a of main street, doesn't seem to impact the walkability. And if anything, it's going to just bring more business to this area, which is doesn't probably have a lot right now as it is. So I, I agree. I, I would be in support of the project. Commissioner Boone. Um, thank you, Vice Chair. So I, I had a lot of questions, and um, whether or not personally I am in favor of drive-throughs, which in general I'm not, um, I think they have met all the criteria, and they've answered my questions with respect to the things we are supposed to be looking at tonight, which is the conditional use and the two... Um, the two uh, variances. Um, the buffer is explained, and I can get my head around that. There really is a buffer, and, and they've satisfied that. And the maximum setback requirement um, on this one corner I don't think is really applicable. So when all is said and done, and the wildlife is going to have a couple of other parcels to move to. Um, particularly along the creek, and so I feel better about that. Um, the traffic along 287 is always a problem, and it's going to continue to be a problem, and I don't think that this will greatly impact that. So, in general, um, I support the project, too. Thank you, Chairman Boone. Chairman Lukacs? Thank you, Vice Chair. Uh, so we, we subjected the, the staff and, and the applicant a lot on, on the drive-through tonight. And uh, I think in the end, 
uh, they convinced me that uh, this uh, drive-through is not creating um, an unsafe uh, impact on uh, pedestrians in particular, but also on the traffic that could uh, potentially had if, if it was um, closer to 287 on Main Street. So um, with that in mind, um, I am um, in, in favor of this project. And like um, Commissioner Boone said, uh, the traffic on 287 and, and 119 and in the area is still going to be um, how it is, or uh, even worse in, in the future. But um, I'm hoping that with all the transportation plans that the city has uh, to improve the corridor and uh, with transit and uh, potential, um, and we have the, um, um, the left-hand greenway right there, uh, potentially some of the traffic could move to other modes of transportation if we um, make a move on that. As, as a city and uh, as individuals. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairman Lukacs. I guess I'll throw my two cents in there. Um, I, I largely am supportive of everything that uh, the other commissioners brought up, and uh, I am supportive of this project. You know, I think uh, the, the drive through you know, is really what we were here to review. And um, while I want to be sensitive to what's happening and what our uh, city council peers are, are, are talking about in the current discussions, and I want to be visionary, um, I think we also need to be careful not to be too reactionary and too reactionary to a, a study session or the cover of the Times call today. And I think um, uh, Mr. Blazik actually kind of put it best when he said, you know, when he reminded us that um, staff had reviewed reviewed these various items, made their recommendations. This is off of existing code, not code that might be down the road, not rules that might be coming down the road. We'll certainly take those into consideration when they're real and permanent and uh, part of our review criteria. But right now, they're not. So, um, I'm. You know, I'm able to move beyond the concerns around the drive-through and. Um, I think safe walkable spaces uh, really resonated with me and this is not, I don't anticipate this really impacting the safe walkable space. Um, and I want, you know, I want there to be safe walkable spaces for um, Miss Angel and Miss Bayless and, and the whole community and the Salamanders. Um, but I think for the sake of this project, um, I would be favorable of it too. And I appreciate the applicant um, already revealing their ability to be cooperative with the prairie dogs and meeting the criteria or meeting the city's recommendation for how to manage those. Uh, so maybe with that, does anyone have a motion? Uh, I'd like to make a motion then that we adopt PZR 2022-7-7B with the condition that the Prairie dogs are relocated or whatever uh, prairie dog mitigation gets done. Okay, so we have a motion on the table for uh, approval of PZR 2022-11B, and we'll just use the... Uh, oh, sorry, I'm sorry, what am I looking at? Seven, isn't it? Is it seven? I'm sorry, forgive me one second. Uh, seven? Okay, seven. Um, and we'll just stick with the copy that's uh, provided on, in our packet and provided by the, uh, by the city staff. Is there any further discussion? Okay, do we have a second? Uh, Chairman Boone? I'll second the motion. Okay, we have a second. Uh, Jane, I think we'll take a vote. Commissioner Tedda? Aye. Com Vice Chairman Goldberg? Aye. Commissioner Kohler? Aye. Commissioner Lukacs? Aye. Commissioner Boone? Aye. Vice Chairman Goldberg, that passes unanimously five to zero. Thanks, Jane. In one of my stack of papers is the right thing that I have to read right now, so just give me one second. 
Okay. Uh, so this item now enters a seven day appeal period. During this time, any aggrieved party may appeal the commissioner's decision by submitting a written appeal letter stating why the Planning and Zoning Commission's decision should be amended or reversed by city council. All appeals must be in writing and must be received in the city clerk's office and the planning office within seven, the seven day appeal period. It looks like that appeal period begins today, August, tomorrow, August 18th, and ends Wednesday, August 24th. Um, I just want to, before we close out, um, thank the commission for a, a robust discussion and the applicant and the um, city staff for their answers. Uh, I think we had a you know, robust conversation, reviewed the feedback from the public, and I um, applaud you for uh, getting us across the finish line. I think with that, maybe we should make, take a five minute break, uh, come back at, what is that, 8.22, we'll come back at 8.22 and resume. Is that, or is my clock off? Uh, it says, oh, I'm sorry, 8.52, 8.52.
All right, shall we reconvene? Looks like the next item on. It looks like the next item on our agenda is the Westview Acres annexation. Uh, so we'll start with Don Burchett. Thank you, Vice Chair Goldberg, members of the commission. Um, Hey, folks, could we go ahead? We're reconvening. Could we go ahead and um, have a quiet in the room? Uh, excuse me. So, uh, Vice Chair Goldman, members of the commission, Don Burchett, planning manager for the city of Longmont. Um, I am here tonight uh, to present. Brian is also listed on the uh, application. We were hit by the great resignation as well. Um, Ava, who was with us for a number of years, has taken another job and left. She was the one who was the project planner on this for uh, through the COVID time. And uh, so you are here, you get me tonight, and uh, I will do my best to walk you through what's going on and to help everybody understand the process as well as the overall application. And then the applicant, Mr. Bestall, will come up and do a presentation and walk you through more of the detail and review criteria. So uh, with that, I will uh, go ahead and get started. I also wanted to just say that um, I have Jim Engstead here as well. Uh, he is the director of public works engineering and his staff are the folks that work with us on, on development review. So that is your drainage engineers, your transportation engineers, uh, water, sewer, and um, transportation. So he knows it all, as you uh, heard earlier. So he is here as well to answer any general questions. So I appreciate him being here. So. First of all, I just want to make sure because, you know, I know we have a few new members on the Planning Commission and I'm not certain whether or not this is uh, the first or many of the annexation applications that you've looked at. So I just wanted to kind of walk through that as well as for the public's benefit. So the Planning Commission's role tonight is one of a recommending body under the Development Code. You will be making a recommendation to the City Council who will ultimately decide whether or not to annex the property into the city of Longmont and whether or not to grant any development rights on that property. So your role as spelled out in the Land Development Code is to obviously review this project against the review criteria which I've got on the screen and we're in your packet. Those are specific to the general criteria that are required for all development applications and then specific criteria related to annexations. And I think Jack will go through those when he does his uh, presentation. The, after I'm finished and after um, Mr. Bustall finishes up his presentation, obviously we'll have a public hearing where the neighborhood can speak and bring up any concerns or issues. Uh, we've noted those in the communication as well as included the items that we had in the file for the comments that we had received from the adjacent neighbors as well as some of the HOAs uh, that are in the area that had concerns with the development application. So after the public hearing is over and after your discussions and answering any questions that you have, then obviously you'll get to make a, a recommendation. And I do want to point out that, you know, as we always know in our presentations, you have the ability to make conditions or recommend, make a recommended condition to the council if you feel that there is an issue that is brought up by the neighborhood that you feel needs to be addressed. Um, and so there is that option to adopt a PZR that allows you to add conditions to address a, a issue that you feel needs to be maybe looked at more in order to meet those review criteria. So that is within your purview. I just wanna make sure everyone was clear on that. So on the screen right now, we have uh, two insets. Uh, the first is an aerial photograph and there's pink dots because I'm not smart enough to be able to draw a line around the property. Uh, in question, it shows the existing two parcels that have existing single family homes on them. And that is the area that is proposed to be annexed that we're gonna be talking about tonight. The property is adjacent to Airport Road on its east. To the north, we have Glen Eyre that uh, goes and comes in and makes us a sweeping curve down to the south and to the west. And we have the Somerset Meadows development that it was developed in the city of Longmont to the east and the north. And then we have the Summerlin property, which is the properties to the south that was developed in Boulder County. If you look to the uh, left diagram, 
what you'll see there is a, a cutout from the Longmont Area Comprehensive Plan, Envision Longmont, the, the land use map. And what we have there where the blue line is um, kind of makes this jog here. This is the property in question. The Envision document identifies this property as single family neighborhood. The Envision doc document, the comprehensive plan, allows for one to eight units per acre with this type of land use designation on the property. And then as you'll note, to the south, the Summerlin area, the, the color has changed as well as across the street uh, to the east of Airport Road. And those are rural neighborhood. And those areas are, according to our plans, are allowed to develop at one unit to the acre. So I know there were some concerns about compatibility that were expressed. And so I just wanted to point out that there are different land use designations in our comprehensive plan for the properties to the south than they are to the north and to the west. So, so that is some of the difference in um, sizes that were developed previously when they went through development review was related to that. This area has been in our comprehensive plan since 1996. Um, so this area has been identified for future development. Uh, before I actually started here, and that was a long time ago. So um, that's just a little background for you on that. An overview of the proposal is it's an annexation for 7.6 acres approximately. The developable land, which includes the two parcels with the existing homes on, it's approximately 6.8 acres. And then they will be annexing in the airport road right of way adjacent to the property. So we will have full control over the area. Uh, that is adjacent to this parcel. Boulder County made a comment that if there are any improvements that need to be done further down the road to allow for a cell D cell lanes or changes to the median, that they would ask that we annex those areas so that it's done under our jurisdiction. And obviously, you know, we will do our best to confirm that what is being shown currently on the plans meets the the needs for the development that's being proposed. But uh, we we are respectful of their requests and understand that. The proposed zoning for the property is residential single family. Uh, that is in the keeping with the designation and envision Longmont on the land use plan. That is the zoning that allows for one to eight units per acre. It allows for single family development and it also allows for accessory dwelling units either within uh, the basement or within the home as well. But um, obviously, at this stage, we're talking about the annexation and a potential 22 units, but it is a use anyway that is allowed in that zoning district. So I thought it was important to just note that. Of the 22 single family lots, the lot sizes are shown vary from the smallest of a 5,677 square foot lot up to a 28,795 square foot lot. At least that's based on the current concept plan, obviously through the platting process, sometimes these can shift a little bit as we get true and accurate survey dimensions and know exactly the, the square footages after they've surveyed those. The density that's proposed on this property then comes to approximately 3.2 dwelling units per acre, which is well within the one to eight units for the, um, the land use designation. Um, I included the utility plan because I thought it was a little bit clearer and easier to see than the, the concept plan with the, the, the colors for the, the landscaping. So uh, this is in your packet, but I just want to want to walk through here just a, a few things for you. And, you know, the first thing that I want to point out is that the access to this development is proposed to come off with a public street off of Airport Road. So it would be served by a public public street and public streets within the development. The um, applicant is also able to meet our needs for a second means of access for fire and emergency vehicles with a proposed emergency access to the north of the, of the development. Um, they are currently proposing to save the two existing houses, which um, you know, and as, as we've seen in the past, we think that from sustainability standpoint, it's always good to try to preserve and reuse things instead of sending them to the, to the landfill. 
Um, so the way that this is laid out right now, that would allow for the preservation of these houses and then any kind of remodeling that they may may want to do or or, or look at. The um, next thing that I want to point out is that while the two existing homes are on the largest of the two lots, um, if you look at the rest of the way the lots are kind of laid out, most of the, the, the the two lots over here on the west side are probably the largest out of the rest of the lots, and then they taper to smaller lots as you head towards the south and towards the east, towards Airport Road. Um, a variety of lot sizes are being provided, which um, while I know there's some concerns with compatibility of the neighborhood, um, you know, it does meet some of our recommendations in the comprehensive plan of trying to provide a variety of housing um, sizes within the community. Um, so this this would allow for different sizes of homes to be constructed on, on the development. The annexation itself, we have reviewed the annexation maps. We've looked at the state statute requirements that the state sets forth for us to be able to annex property in. Our analysis shows that it does meet those requirements that are set out by the state of Colorado. We also believe that it's met the land development code requirements for what's been submitted. And then um, the DRC, the Development Review Committee, reviewed and looked at the project as well as the information that was submitted that included the traffic analysis, the environmental analysis, the utility and drainage um, concepts. Uh, at this stage, we typically do not get into detailed engineering at annexation, partly because we are trying to understand basics. We're not trying to get into the final design because if council does not annex it, then it's, it's a lot of effort, a lot of review time for our staff to go through if it's not gonna be annexed. Those detailed plans would come in during our preliminary and our final uh, subdivision process where we would then get into more of the nitty gritty where we're looking at the calculations and making sure that things meet obviously design requirements and good engineering practices. Um, the last thing that I want to, again, just note, which I, I pointed out earlier, is that, again, our emergency services folks reviewed this, and they believe that what is shown right now meets their requirements and their needs for emergency access into the property. So where are we at right now with the annexation review process? Um, as you can see, we're at the Planning Commission public hearing. Uh, we have gone through a referral to the City Council where the applicant made a request for the Council to let them start the annexation process that's required under our code. No one can turn in an annexation without the Council giving it a blessing to start. There is no guarantee that when you start the process that you're going to be annexed. It is just an ability for them to tell us that they are willing to let a project come into the city. So that has already happened. A neighborhood meeting was held. As you saw in the packet, there was information from the neighbors that was included as well as our staff with some of the information about the neighborhood meeting on the noticing and things that had to occur. We also then had the application submitted after that meeting. We did the formal application, confirmed that everything was there that was required and allowed it to go through our process through development review, committee review. Uh, during that DRC re review process, it's a little, almost a year through our process that we've been looking at this to confirm that it meets the requirements for the city and for the state of Colorado. And tonight is the public hearing, so you guys get to make a recommendation to the city council. And then for the folks in the audience's benefit, you know, we at this time are trying to shoot for an October public hearing. Uh, state statute has many requirements of noticing and different resolutions that have to be approved and passed by the council in order for them to have a public hearing. We have to notify the county as well as many districts and let them know that the annexation is pending. All of that takes a certain amount of time, about six weeks, and that's on a, on a good day. Um, so October is an estimate right now. It, it, it could slip into November, but I just wanted to let this the uh, citizens know that. So if they are gonna continue to follow this, that they at least have some idea of when to expect their next letters and when to see the postings going up on the property again. 
So the neighbors, as you saw, had have uh, submitted quite a few uh, letters and and identified quite a few concerns that they have, and I'm hopeful that they will go through those with you tonight and provide more detail about those. I wanted to just give a general summary for you besides what was in the packet. But the concerns that I took away with going through those letters and reading through those was that there's obviously the compatibility issue. Everything from lot sizes, home prices, home sizes, home quality, proposed density, all of those are very concerning for the people that live in and around this. And I think uh, one of the neighbors made a point, you know, when they bought into the su these subdivisions, these were, you know, these were not the, the typical um, corporate builders coming in. These were individuals that had custom homes built and had unique designs and they have very beautiful neighborhoods. So I think we can all understand kind of their concerns with seeing some of the development and maybe not understanding, um, you know, what's going to come in the future. What What is it going to look like? There were also questions about traffic impacts onto Airport Road. Um, you know, we've looked at the traffic impact report. Um, you know, Jim can speak to that, but we have not identified any issues with that. We sent the referral to the school district to confirm that there's capacity in the schools that are in that area. All of those are below the 125% benchmark that the school district and the city council have agreed on for not exceeding. So there is capacity in the schools for the students that would be generated in that letter from the school district was in your packet. Uh, drainage concerns, uh, there were some really, uh, I, I thought the ducks in the pictures were, uh, were kind of neat to see, but I can understand their concerns with seeing water that stays for a long time in, a, in an area and then reading about somebody's house getting flooded. Um, I can understand that. I don't know at this stage with annexation that we can tell you what's you know, for sure going to happen, but, you know, I think we understand the concern and we understand what the state laws are requiring with the release of the historic flows and where those go and how we have to make sure those are addressed. So we have looked at those. And then the other one that um, jumped out at me was a lack of buffers to the adjacent development. Um, you know, the homes to the west as well as uh, to the south, I think, have noted that there's a lack of buffers towards those two portions of the neighborhood. Um, there's an existing buffer in the Somerset Meadows development to the north, and so um, there, there is a buffer there, but those are some of the concerns that I took away from reading through and just wanted to point those out for the, the commission. So finally tonight again, as you, I always tell you, you have three options tonight. You get to make a recommendation. You can either recommend to approve, can recommend to approve with conditions, or you can recommend denial. The decisions that you make need to be based on the information that you have as well as the review criteria. And if you have any questions on either motions or even conditions, obviously staff is here to always help you with those if you, if you feel that's appropriate. And then staff is recommending approval of the annexation and our analysis of the review criteria looking at the regulations that we have to follow. We believe that the applicants has submitted what is required and meets those review criteria. So we are recommending approval of PZR 2022-8A. And that ends my presentation and I'm happy to answer questions now or later. It's your choice. Things done. Let's do that later, and I'd like to hear from the applicant. Vice Chair Goldberg, would you like me to begin? Yes, please. Uh, I'm glad to be here tonight. My name is Jack Bestall. I'm the 
the project representative, the owner's rep. I'm also the planner uh, on the project. Uh, we have been working on this for uh, actually two and a half, maybe three years. Uh, the last year more intensively. It was a difficult uh, site to acquire uh, and um, there were some other complexities. So we appreciate this threshold with you this evening. And during the last uh, six months or so, we've worked more carefully and tried to listen to the neighborhood as we brought forth our plan and work with them on that. Um, I think Don has covered m much of what I was thinking of doing. Um, and I don't want to be redundant. You, you already know the location here and um, the area th of this Longmont planning area as well as its adjacency to the service area. Um, let's go ahead. Um, I'm going to look at the at the requirements in a little bit more detail. Um, so th these are state standards. Not less than one sixth of the proposed annexation area uh, must be contiguous. We have about seventy six point thirty one percent. There's a community interest that exists. It, that's an important aspect. Uh, the subject parcel is adjacent land in the municipality and it starts to create that community interest which we can look at in more detail. There, it was mentioned that this property of course is, are the lots and there's also an, an outlot to that that is owned by, our, by the property owners but the, this also is the section you'll see on the annexation map that is the airport road portion of the annexation as proposed. The state criteria further talks about you know, you have to submit to petitions, have the property, the owners be in favor of this. Property, uh, is, as I mentioned, is in, is in both the planning area and adjacent to the services area. Um, it conforms to the Longmont land use plan, is consistent with the adjacent zoning. The, the adjacent neighborhood is also zoned RSF, one to eight to the acre, even though it's a large little lot uh, community. Um, it won't limit integration is another criteria the state has. So that, that, that's, that's a quick overview of state requirements. Longmont, in addition, we mentioned the MSA and LPA already. Uh, it, encourage, it, it needs to encourage nat natural and well-ordered development, distribute the costs of development among those. When we first went to the council <coughs> with this project for a referral, uh, that evening we did not get referred. And the reason we didn't get referred was the question was brought up to staff was does this project pay its way? That we, we the council, was saying we don't want to have projects that, that can't sustain themselves and, and uh, not only in fees but in terms of uh, municipal services and, and monthly, you know, monthly uh, maintenance, et cetera. And there wasn't, we didn't have a clean answer for that. We didn't know if eight to the acre would sustain itself, one to the acre. And we came back at, uh, later with a referral that was about 3.5 to the acre, 3.5 dwelling units to the acre. And we'll touch on that in a little more detail as we move forward. Um, extend municipal government services, simplify government structure in urban areas. Those are also uh, local criteria. Additional Longmont annexation provides a system to extend regulations, reduces friction among municipalities. I like that one. How do you reduce friction? That's, you can ask Glenn that later. Increases ability of Longmont to provide uh, services, will not limit integration, includes owner's waiver of private vested rights, meets Longmont's environmental requirements. I think you know where it is now off of Airport Road, the two lots plus the, on the south there's some ownership as well. So it, it also needs to conform to the, to the comprehensive plan, the Envision Longmont, and it does. It provides sustainable new home neighborhood, it conforms with comprehensive land use, provides livable neighborhood and residential d diversity, and it conforms with Longmont subdivision standards, or it will when it gets formalized. So the plan that we have presented this evening, which um, 
Don showed the utility, con the concept for the utility plan. You could see the, the lots more clearly. Um, this shows the access, the main access off of Airport Road, as Don already indicated. It has a loop road with either a right in, right out, or an EVA emergency vehicle access. Either one is acceptable. And then there are, a, there are um, seven lots along the north property line, the larger lots along the west, and um, the two existing homes here in the middle. And we did, we looked at these very carefully. Uh, the, one of the neighborhood's critiques of the process was they would prefer to have these homes torn down. And that came out of the neighborhood meetings. And, and I was able to meet with several of them in their homes and talk about it some more. But they just felt they were of not a sufficient quality. We believe they can be renovated and repurposed. And they're not, by most standards, they're not bad, bad homes. Uh, so that was the, that's kind of our, the direction we're heading at this point. Um, the concept plan that you just saw matches the lotting pattern of the neighborhood to the west. There's an 80-foot buffer on the north. When we talk about that buffer, this is the 80-foot easement that is owned by the neighborhood right here. It also is used for drainage and for uh, utilities, both uh, primarily uh, sewer and then water also will cross over here. But that's that 80-foot so-called buffer uh, which is open space there, uh, not a park, just it is, it is a space. And then no traffic, and then there was a concern about no traffic was introduced into the adjacent neighborhood. Um, that, that all the access is to Airport Road. The, the traffic sh a study indicates about 208 average daily trips, perhaps 40 peak, uh, so it's not a big number. Limits access points to Airport Road. And they really, those access points are where the staff traffic engineer and our traffic engineer uh, have considered that they should go. Uh, and of course, there will be a trail, a, a major trail along Airport Road, sidewalk and so forth. So there, there will be that improvement for walkability. This, going back now in time, not too far, just a, a few months, this was the plan that we showed at the neighborhood meeting and that we talked to the, to the neighbors about. This was this is probably the sixth or seventh plan that had, we had worked through with staff over about a year and a half period, and this one indicates uh, 24 lots, including the two existing. It, these are the three home sites to the to the west existing, and these are the, the four to the north, and then it shows a looping system. Uh, in order to access these lots, uh, emergency services fire wanted to have an alley here so that there was continuous capability for emergency vehicles. So th and the, the access points were the same on Airport Road. So this is actually what the neighbor what was discussed at the neighborhood meeting and in subsequent meetings before and after that. Um, there was uh, a number of concerns, and, and the, but the primary comments I think uh, Don touched on, um, the de they felt the density is too high. I think they still feel that. Uh, it's about, at this point on this plan, it was 3.5. The traffic and through, they were concerned about traffic and through neighborhood access. The west emergency loop, I'm kind of calling it that. That's this, you know, a 25 foot road, which would, Probably not be used a whole lot, but it would also but it would provide access to the area here. That was a concern. I met with the neighbors, uh, uh, one of the homes on the west side, and we discussed that specifically. The drainage and runoff water quality. There's a ditch on the north in that 80 foot uh, area, and there's drainage, and there's been backing up uh, according to the neighbors, and they've had some difficulties with that. Uh, so th there is a real concern about that Holland Ditch. We, and the Holland Ditch also put out a comment that said they wouldn't accept any more runoff into their ditch. I spoke with them about that and said, you know, by state law, you have to take the historic flow onto your adjacent property. I mean, legally, we have to have it go. Wherever it's going now, historically, it has to go there. And when I was talking to their vice president, he said, oh, yeah, you're right. We didn't mean we won't take the flow. We meant we were concerned about water quality. 
So there was this, there was a real interesting discussion we had, and he's concerned about water quality running off a of development to a downstream user, you know, like a, a perhaps a farmer down, downstream that they're serving. And we are too, by the way. When this comes back, if it does get annexed for a plat and for the, the hydrological design, that'll be utmost, I'm sure, in terms of city standards and in terms of our effort to make sure that filtration, water quality, all those things are handled in an appropriate manner. Another concern was, uh, I, I use the word scrape existing homes because that's what they said. They felt they were a poor quality and the plan could be better without them. New homes below the neighborhood. They also felt that new homes would never match up to the homes that they have in their neighborhood. And you may hear more about that this evening. Um, I, I don't necessarily agree. This is a beautiful homes they have, beautiful neighborhood. Um, w this has gone on so long and we know we have more, another year or so ahead of us. In fact, if we're allowed to go forward with the annexation, you know, I can't tell you what the prices are gonna be for these, but I know the lots are gonna be smaller. This is gonna be an opportunity to create more diversity. Uh, we're gonna be required to provide affordable housing by the IZO, as you guys know. Um, and uh, it could be on site, or it could be off site, or it could be in lieu. So we're, we're not there yet in making that decision, but that's a part of, that's a part of the development formula. And then there was a desire for more open space. Always there's, a, that, there's always a desire for that, for sure. So what we did is we looked at what we could do with that plan that I showed you previously, and we reduced the density from 24 to 22 units. Uh, so that was about 3.2 dwelling units per acre at that point. There's no through neighborhood access. Emergency loop was removed on the west side. One lot was removed from the north so we could have a little bit more, a little bit larger lots on the north against the 80 foot buffer or 80 foot open space easement. Uh, landscape buffer was integrated into the plan. I think we can do a, a good job of landscape and have a little bit uh, bigger setback areas along the north and the west um, and the south and I'll explain that. Housing diversity, this, this really matches up with the fact that, you know, the, the comprehensive plan in Longmont, as you well know, really is pushing for that. We have several projects in, in Longmont, uh, maybe five, six or seven right at this point. Many of them are very much focused on affordable and attainable. This one is less focused on that, but we know, but we will meet the requirement. Um, renovating existing homes, we think of that as a sustainable effort and I already, I already mentioned the drainage and water quality as being a concern that we think we can answer with, in fact, this project may help water quality at the end of the day with today's capabilities that we have. So how does the plan fit? What about this compatibility question? Around us, around this site, there are larger lots. To give you an idea, this is a 0.56 acre lot to the west of us, to, when I say us, to the west of Westview Acres. This is a 0.38 acre lot, and I think this is 0.61, this one to the east. I also looked a little bit more to kind of get this in scale. These two houses are about 45 feet apart. Uh, this, these two are, are there's another, um, uh, the adjacency is important to us. In this case, where we would set a house on this building envelope, meeting the RSF standards, this is about 135 feet building to building here. And of course, this is the 80 foot so-called buffer or open space easement that their neighborhood controls, they own it. And this, this building to building, once you were to put it, it with the setbacks is about 155 feet building to building. Um, here we have the 0.56 acre lot. Th this is our largest lot, I think, or close to it, it's 0.66. This is also a large lot here. So this is a good relationship. This is only 0.35, so third of an acre. And then this, this one, I don't, I don't, I guess I didn't put the number in here, but the building to building is about 75 feet. So wh what we think we can do when we get, if we're annexed and if we go ahead with the plat, we can look at a probably a 25 foot heavy landscape buffer along this side, along in these lots. And then this is an easement for water to go out and connect to Glen Eyre. Uh, and then we also can do uh, probably a 20 foot landscape buffer ag adjacent to the 80 foot. Um, the other thing we did is we moved the smaller lots over here to the east side 
and they're kind of alley served, kind of a unique set of, of residential here. And there's already a landscape buffer planted out on the east side. On the south side, let's, um, we have our road, which is about 54 foot, and it has tree lawns on both sides. So in terms of this existing home, we'd be about 140 building to building here. So that gives you an idea of relationship scale, uh, what really is happening if this project were to, to go ahead. Here you can see it on a little bit larger scale, the 45 foot in between these two houses. And these are, this is approximate. I was obviously using Google on this. 135, the, the acreages are correct according to the county assessor. Uh, and you can see the scale of this and where we're looking at this buffer and so forth. Here's the west side uh, with the relationships there and the building to building distances we think will probably occur. Uh, the south side with the 54 foot road and tree lawn. Uh, and then this, this is, what happens here is there's actually the city of Longmont is our, there we have there's a, a piece of city of Longmont that comes along the south side. And this is in Boulder County uh, where Summerlin is. And then of course the east side with the cluster of small lots. So that's the concept plan. Uh, for an annexation, this is probably too detailed. <laughs> it's, it's getting down into quite a bit of detail considering it's a policy question about annexation. But we, we've really enjoyed, in fact, working with the neighbors. I know there's some frustration on their part. But I can tell you we've, we've spent time, and, and that, not more, more importantly, but we've tried to listen and, and see what we could do with this plan and still make it feasible for us to do a project that we think is uh, in conformance with the Longmont policies and standards. So in terms of the public interest, uh, conformance with the Vision Longmont plan, it's 3.2 dwelling units per acre in a range that could have been one to eight. It, it really takes underutilized lands and it'll make a contribution economically to the community. It'll pay its way, we know that, we did modeling we did modeling at 24 units, and 22 is right on the edge of where it won't pay its way. So the larger density after that, and not in all cases, but in this circumstance, it, it's, at, it's right at the break even Well, it'll stay in a positive cash flow for, this, for the city. New residential as the city bonding base, supports existing infrastructure, diversifies the housing, provides three affordable units uh, to be determined how we handle that. And of course, it will retire the on-site septic and wells um, that currently service the, the project. So that's, um, that's the project, that's the concept plan. Happy to answer any questions and I appreciate your support in, in uh, recommending for this to go to the council. Thank you, Mr. Vestal. Um, I'll take a quick, quick look and see if there's any immediate questions. Otherwise, looking at the clock, I think we should, oops. Commissioner Kohler? Yeah, I just have one question that might be helpful before we open it up to the public. Um, and maybe this is for Don. How, how, how strict do they have to keep to the concept plan once it's annexed? How much flexibility is there in that? <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, Vice Chairman Goldberg, Commissioner Kohler, the land development code uh, has a section in the annexation area where it talks about this and then when we annex properties we also enter into a, an agreement it's an annexation agreement it's a private contract between the city and the property owner and the wording in there is pretty specific in that it says that the concept plan is to be followed if it's not going to be followed then it needs to be amended by the city council at a public hearing so they actually would have to come back with a new concept plan that would be taken through DRC review and then ultimately to the city council for them to consider. And so that is how that would work. Thanks, Don. Thanks, Commissioner Kohler. Um, with that, then I think I'll go ahead and open up the uh, public invited to be heard section of this agenda item. Um, so I have a list of uh, folks who have signed up to speak, you'll have an opportunity. <laughs> there was a list put out in advance of the meeting or just before the agenda started. Um, you'll be able to, to come down after we get through the list. 
Uh, so uh, we have a list here of folks who um, have asked to be uh, to speak. Uh, you have five minutes. Uh, we'll ask you to state your name and address before you begin. Um, Jane over here is tracking the timer. You'll get a heads up when you run out of uh, time. Uh, and as I said, if you didn't get your name on the list, of course, we'll um, hear from you as well following those speakers. Uh, with that, I think we'll go ahead and start with, um, is it Jack Bestall? The, yeah, okay, you were as the one presenting. Uh, then we'll move on to Ari De La Aria de, de la Lama, nice. Aria de la Lama. By the third meeting, you'll get my name. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, all right, so my name is Ariel de la Lama. Uh, I live on 2118 Summerlin Drive, uh, one of the adjacent homes to the development. I'm, in, uh, I'm here to, um, you know, representing the Somerset Meadows HOA and the 67 homeowners in the, in the community. Um, as Jack and is it Don, you know, has have mentioned, we communicated extensively via you know letters and, and uh, you know mails and other in, in other you know um, methods. Um, I'll outline the key issues that we have um, put in them in, in our letter uh, to the planning uh, staff. Their drainage density buffer uh, and traffic. What I'll say is that uh, I want to make sure that the committee understands that, you know, uh, we do not oppose the development, right, uh, or the growth or, you know, affordable housing. We just cannot support the development in the current form that has been submitted um, because of several key issues that we have, lack of information, and some, cr you know, critical components that we believe are uh, detrimental to the existing homeowners uh, in the community. Um, on drainage, um, you know, uh, there's several key issues that, that we see. Ken Wilson, one of my neighbors, will speak to the issues in detail. Um, I think what I would say is that we believe that, the, you know, we could be, you know, impacted by the potential issues. Um, we also believe that the city could have, you know, significant cost and develop or the applicant as well in the future. So it's something that we really need to understand before we, we move forward. As uh, homeowners and the HOA, what we need is city assurances um, and, you know, indemnification from the applicant or the developer if something were to go wrong in the future. Um, buffer, I'll make it very, very brief. Um, you know, given the significant changes that, that you know, we, that there are from where we are today for um, the current land to where it's going in the future, uh, we will want to make sure that there's sufficient buffer um, and that the city, you know, um, requires the developer to uh, put enough, you know, fencing, uh, trees, anything that helps, you know, with that issue. Um, on traffic, uh, it is, you know, I, I, I read the report. It's not clear to me how we uh, um, came up to the, the conclusion that the is, you know, it's, it's going to be low impact. Um, you know, we, we believe this could be significant. Um, also not clear, I think the, the recommendation from the staff was that there's no need for a right turning lane into the neighborhood when every other, you know, uh, neighborhood in, in Airport Road has one. Uh, if you really um, have been driving in Airport Road, I mean, traffic has increased significantly. From the, um, from the traffic light in Pike all the way to 119, that's one of the fastest sections, I think, in Airport Road. Um, so not having a right turning lane will mean that the cars will have to come to almost a complete stop to turn into this neighborhood, which I think will create a lot of issues. Also, if there's a new development or future development across the street, that would also mean that the left lane will be impacted by people coming out of that neighborhood. And so I think there's a, there's a lot of complex issues on traffic that um, need to be addressed in its totality. It can't be just this one neighborhood that you know, we look at and, and say there's no issues. I think that there's a lot more that we need to look at to be able to say that there's no impact whatsoever. Um, density. Um, I said in, in our letter, you know, we, we think there's, there's some issues with density. Um, the, uh, you know, I think Jack says that the overall uh, density is 3.2 per acre. I think that's on average. I think if you take out the big lots, it's a much, you know, much smaller lots than the surrounding neighborhoods. Not only the surrounding neighborhoods, but, but also to the homes that will be in the inside. So when you really look at the plan, it, it may look really odd, you know, to see very small lots surrounded by very big lots. Um, I think because of the density that is being proposed, there's also a lack of green space. Uh, for us, you know, that's a quality of life issue. 
meaning that the existing, existing homeowners that will buy into this uh, place or, or families will have no place to spend time outside. What that means is that they will flow into our neighborhood. And, you know, maybe what we have is not designed to sustain, you know, 22 more homes. And so I think that's a potential issue that we see. We spend a lot of money to maintain what we have for the use of our residents. Um, also, the airport road, you know, issue is the homes are too close and too far into airport road. And that's, again, I think, you know, causing the, maybe the, the proposal to not have uh, um, a, a right turning lane. So to close in the last few minutes, what I would say is um, we believe that the plan as proposed uh, has significant economic impact potentially to us uh, as a community. Um, maybe, you know, having a lower density and in a more balanced plan could help, you know, us, um, mitigate some of the risks that we see or the potential issues. And so I think you're going to hear from everybody else in the, in the room, you know, more about this, this potential issues. But thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. De La Lama. Uh, with that, uh, Ken Wilson is next. Would staff put up that initial staff map, please, that said uh, location. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Ken Wilson. I live with my family at 3904 Glen Eyre Drive, which is right across the street from the um, neighbors who are adjacent to the property. We live, in fact, right on that uh, curve in the Glen Eyre um, on the um, north side. Um, so I'm going to speak to you on drainage. Um, I have some credentials which I think are relevant here. Um, we've lived in Longmont for four years. Before that, we lived 23 years in Boulder. I was on Boulder City Council for six years and on the Boulder uh, Water Board for five years in addition to that and chair of that board for two years. Um, I'm, I was also for two years on the board of the Urban Drainage and Flood Control um, district, which is the whole metro area, looking at drainage and flood issues uh, for the very large area of Denver Metro, including Boulder and many other cities around. So um, I have some concerns with drainage on the north side of the proposed property. So this would impact several of my neighbors. Um, not me particularly, but this area where I'm pointing is a drainage area. The HOA owns that property, as Jack explained, and it is um, kind of a major drainage for everything west of this area. So all of the new development that's gone into the west of, of this section that's shown drains through that one area. There are some ponds um, above this area and um, all of that new development, hundreds and hundreds of houses. So um, there's already backing up of water right before Airport Road and my neighbor to the immediate north of that um, is already experiencing uh, sump pump running a lot of the time. We had a half inch of rain yesterday. It ponded up with just that half inch in this area. If we had gotten the 3.5 inches of rain like Broomfield did yesterday, that would have been a major problem. So I'm sure that the applicant can make a retention area that will contain most flows. But if we get a flood, I just don't know where the water is going to go. It looks like it will actually flow onto Airport Road. There's a berm along this uh, floodway that prevents water from flowing to, from the annex property into this floodway. 
So I believe that the water will go out into a small culvert, culvert that appears to be plugged and will probably flow onto Airport Road. So I'm concerned that one, it will then back up into this floodway and cause even more problems for my neighbors, but also that the city may have a problem with uh, flooding on Airport Road that might be expensive to fix. So I really think that uh, you should not approve this tonight. You should send it back to staff for uh, more thorough uh, evaluation of drainage issues uh, before you recommend this to council. Otherwise, I think we could have expensive problems going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Uh, next up, we have Robert. Is it Robert Hallman? Good evening. Uh, before I start, there is an exhibit that we did not get a chance, I think, to get you in this form, and I would just like to hand up a couple of things if I could reserve my five minutes. <laughs> That's fine. That. We'll restart the timer. Would you please uh, state your name and address before you begin? Yes, again, uh, good evening. My name is Robert Hallman. I live at 3703 Glen Eyre Road, which directly uh, sets directly uh, on the northern boundary of the proposed uh, project. and. I bought my property uh, about six years ago. Uh, one of the prime reasons I bought it was the open view and the feeling of being in nature that was present at the time and has continued to be present, uh, but certainly will be have a major impact if this is approved. And the notion uh, suggested by the applicant that there's a buffer on the north side, what he's talking about is some open space. That's not a buffer, that's open space. A buffer consists of landscaping, it consists of adequate fencing for privacy, it consists of you know, trees and things that essentially provide you with a sense of privacy in a sense that you're not a part of the neighborhood that's going to be changed. So with respect to compatibility, you know, that is, I think, cr criterion four. It's one of the key criterion for annexing, permitting an annex annexation. Um, it's obviously a policy issue for you commissioners. It's not a check the box issue. Um, even though the applicant kind of presents it in that fashion, uh, noting that and the staff as well, kind of, because it's really not their area. They give you facts, but the applicant's position that, well, we're between one and eight, which is the restriction, uh, that we're going to uh, design to state standards and we apply and we're going to comply with those laws, those are important commitments. But in my opinion, they have nothing to do with compatibility. Obviously, he's going to comply with the law, it's got to comply with the law. Compatibility is a policy question that deals with the nature and extent of the neighborhood that's being considered and its impact on the existing neighborhood. You have an existing neighborhood that you can look at the exhibit that I gave you that essentially, most, most importantly, is 11 homes that borders the seven and a half acres that's requested to be annexed. Um, the proposed
proposal here is to put 22 homes on seven and a half acres in an extraordinary, and there's no debate really, it's black and white if you look at the overlay, that this is, that the, the, the proposed annexation is not compatible with the surrounding neighborhood in terms of the number of lots, in terms of the density with which they're placed, in, tens, in terms of their configuration, and, and, cons and uh, in terms of their size. Okay. It's, they're clearly not compatible. Okay. And you've got a, a neighborhood that has been established for 15, 20 years. It's got, by everybody's admission, uh, custom-made homes. Uh, there's plenty of diversity there based upon custom-made homes. You know, this is not an issue of whether there's diversity or not. It's really a question of trying to, you know, if I could maybe draw a picture, kind of dropping down into the center of a very well-developed, very high-quality, very well-run in terms of the HOA, their architectural standards, their landscaping standards, and they're highly, they're, they're highly enforced. And that has provided for the kind of diversity and the quality of life that is provided now in that neighborhood. And my basic question is, essentially, you've got a surrounding very key asset for this city. It's a, it's a major asset. Nobody will argue that. It's an asset for the city. It's an asset for the people who live there. And its value is both in terms of its monetary value and its value as a quality of life place. So my real fundamental question as a matter of policy is why would you drop into the middle of that on seven and a half acres that now holds two large, you know, they're old, they're old homes, but they're surrounded by 30 and 40 foot trees. And, and effectively, you're gonna change the nature of the neighborhood and there's really no basis to do it and I don't see any uh, advantage to doing it. And I would just say one thing. I would not buy my house now based upon what I've seen. And I suggest to you folks that in order to get a real sense of the quality of that facility and to put yourself in the right position to see it, you just should do a site visit. Hold a special meeting out there and take a look at it and decide for yourselves. Thank you, Mr. Hellman. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very Apologies much. for cutting you off. But okay, no, I appreciate that. It's, there's a lot of issues, and that's why we wrote uh, five letters and raised issues in those, and I hope they're reviewed. Okay, it's not easy to address in five minutes, but I appreciate very much your help and your time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hellman. Yes. Next up, I think we have, is it Kim Wilms? <laughs> Tim, did you yeah. It looks like Kim Wilms. Forgive me if it's not that name. No? Okay. How about Paul Rothschild? Thanks, Mr. Rothschild. Thank you. Uh, my name is Paul Rothschild. I live at 2124 Summerlin Drive. Um, I live directly to this in the, the uh, southwest corner uh, adjacent to um, the Westview Acres property. Um, we feel that this, uh, my wife and I and my child, we feel this we will be directly impacted by this annexation in the city of Longmont. Um, while we and the other residents have met with the applicant and some modifications have been made, we feel that the concept plan still has many flaws and should be modified further for annexation approval. The proposed current Westview Acres concept plan is not compatible with the homes in both Somerset Meadows and the Summerlin community. The lot sizes are too small, resulting in far too much density. One of the main criteria for approval is an, in, of annexation is compatibility. The current concept plan is not compatible with the two surrounding communities. While we recognize that there are other high density neighborhoods in the vicinity, these neighborhoods are not surrounded by an established neighborhood of large lots and custom homes. Furthermore, this neighborhood would be almost three times the density of the established neighborhoods surrounding it on all three sides. Additionally, there are no detailed information providing provided about privacy fencing or, large, or landscape <coughs> buffers being required by the applicant. We request that the applicant, as a condition of annexation, be required to install privacy fencing to the north and west prior to the land being cleared and homes being built to ensure the safety and privacy of the neighbors 
and residents in the well-established adjacent community. In addition, we ask the applicant be required to have a mature landscape buffer with trees installed on the north, south, and west as a condition of annexation. There are also significant water drainage issues that others have mentioned as well. Um, we find it very disturbing that at the end of the day, the, the, there's no studies that have been actually done before this is approved. It's kind of a shoot first and next questions later. Another big concern is traffic. According to the traffic study provided, Airport Road is already exceeding 2035 traffic projections in the Longmont Road Plan. Airport Road is already an extremely busy road. The traffic light at the intersection of Route 119 and Airport Road cannot currently handle the traffic load in any given day. If you sit in that light, you would see that. Um, if you ever drive there, you sit there for two cars and then you're stuck in the light again. Additionally, one must consider the proposed Kanemoto Estates development also seeking annexation by this applicant. This additional project would add even more strain to Airport Road and should be considered simultaneously. It is our understanding that this would also add an additional 300 plus homes and commercial businesses if approved, creating a substantial traffic nightmare. Another major safety concern, which was spoke about earlier as well, is a lack of a right turning lane into Westview Acres off of Airport Road when driving south into Westview Acres. The current concept plan does not have the ability to have a right turning lane into Westview Acres to avoid potential accidents and traffic congestion as the plan has five homes right up against the airport road, allowing no room for the city or county to install a proper turning lane. So to summarize, um, number one, we'd like to have a vast, vastly reduce the number of lots to be compatible with the size of the lots in the adjacent three sides of the proposed Westview Acres neighborhood, as the applicant does not have compatibility with those adjacent neighborhoods based on the lot sizes on the uh, north, west, and south. The water drainage issue should be addressed prior to approval of the annexation, as concerns have been raised by residences that have not been addressed. The applicant states further studies need to be conducted after approval. The traffic study also shows uh, that it has exceeded 2035 projections like I had mentioned, and with the addition of the proposed 300 plus homes and commercial businesses in both Westview Acres and Kanemoto Estates, development the traffic on Airport Road could be a major concern in the future. And lastly, we request as a condition of annexation that the city council members require the applicant to install a privacy fence prior to the clearing of the land to provide safety and privacy to the communities surrounding Westview Acres to the north and west. In addition, we also request the city council, uh, sorry, the commissioners uh, require the applicant to install a substantial landscape buffer with mature trees to the south, northwest, and sorry, and west of Westview Acres a condition of annexation. Lastly, we understand that the growth is important in, in Walmart and we are not against development. It is important for you to also consider the current residences in these decisions. These approvals will have substantial impacts on all long-standing residences residents and taxpayers in the adjacent communities. I encourage you guys as, a, as commissioners to drive by the proposed Westview Acres development and the surrounding Somerset Meadows and Summerlin communities to see in person how incompatible this proposed concept plan will be in this space. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Rothschild. Okay, that's our list of folks who signed up uh, to speak today. Um, n now we can invite others who didn't quite make the list. Um, so if you just want to come down one at a time. Um. Please state your name and address. My name is Joel Broida. I have the house under construction at uh, 8660 Summerlin Place. And I spent several years looking for a place to build my home around here. And when I finally saw uh, this area, I don't know, I assume all of you have been out there, but when you turn in up onto Glen Eyre, it's a beautiful street, and there are large homes and large lots and large trees, and I'm spending a heck of a lot of money building a house. My property and all the ones around me are over an acre, and I don't think you'd have a lot of objections from most people if this development were on the order of one acre lots. So we have, I, I have the same aesthetic issues that virtually everyone else is bringing up. There's another technical issue that is far from clear, and that is whether the property to be annexed 
whether the landowners actually own all the property that, you're propo or that they're proposing to annex. And in particular, there are several homeowners, a couple of whom are here, who probably own half of this. There's a 40-acre strip between on the south side of, of the Westview Acres annexation. And they most likely own half of that, a 20-foot wide strip there. And it's, there's, I, it, the, the letter that I sent to the city some time ago sort of elaborates the details in, in the history of that and who owned the property. And then it was, you know, the, it was annexed by the city and then it was vacated. And I don't want to go through it all again. Um, but I would strongly suggest that the city take a careful look at that, whether they actually own that property. And that's sort of basically the summary of what I have to say. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Broida. Would anyone else like to come up? Hey, I'm Gino Zond, 8675 Summerlin Place. I'm at the very south uh, edge of this development proposal uh, where all of the headlights would come into my living room and bedroom. And I also want to thank all of my neighbors for being far more prepared for this than I have. Um, I just want to echo everything that everyone has said. And I think the 3.2 number is disingenuous. Uh, if you remove the existing homes, it's closer to somewhere between 4.5 and 5 dwelling units per acre. Uh, so that's something to look into. And as we dig further into whether or not we actually own half of the road, um, I can say that I would never agree to annex my property. So my recommendation for uh, the commissioners would be in addition to the drainage issues and the other things that have been uh, brought up to delay approving this at least until we figure out who owns that property. <clears throat> so. That's it. Thank you, Mr. Zend. Anyone else? Hello, everyone. My name is Hans Shigalis, 2006 Hollyhock Court in Somerset Meadows. The, um, the, the HOA that's, you know, in where the annexations are being proposed. You know, I came here tonight to, to talk about Somerset Meadows and this annexation, but I sat for two hours listening about quail. And it was actually really enlightening to hear that we're, we're actually building more, digging up ground and building more business parks and drive throughs versus repurposing all the vacant big box stores and the business parks. So that's, that's, that was just, that's a, just a little anecdote that I took away from this in those two hours and when I started writing my notes. At the end of the day, we moved here seven years ago from San Francisco, um, where there is no land to develop. They rip and replace, and they build more things. They build up. So there, we do have a lot of land. So as we're looking at this development right here, you know, we spent a lot of money on this house. This is a very de desirable neighborhood that, that I wanted to live in with my family. Um, and and this is we, we picked a house. And at the end of the day, when we're looking at this, we're not opposed to development. I mean, I get it. Let's let them develop, but let's reduce the um, let's make let's make it more compatible with with you know, million and a half dollar price tags and half acre lots. That's all. My, that's all I'm saying. That's my my position. And um, thanks for listening. And I I, I I would hope you guys would reject this and send it back to the developer who really at the end of the day the only people who are making money are these developers. That's who's coming here and talking about this planning. It's like they're developing and making money and and sort of tearing up of what we think is absolutely beautiful. So uh, that's that's all I like to say, and uh, I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chagallos. Forgive me if I didn't quite get that right. Anyone else? Please uh, come on down. Thank you for this opportunity to speak tonight. And I will let everybody know that this is my first time addressing the commission, so I am a little nervous. So please bear with me. Uh, so my name is Rachel Owlett, and I live at 3615 Glenier Drive. 
So that is the first house on Glen Eyre as you enter Somerset Meadows, and we, we were on the north side of the property. Um, what also is, is we have that drainage culvert right behind our house, and we were the house that actually flooded. And when we say flooded, our sump pump actually ran continuously for over two weeks. There was so much water that we actually thought a water main had broken. So we called uh, Longmont Water to come out. They tested the water, and it was groundwater. So the idea of more water coming off a property that right now is grass that can absorb the, the water, going into roads and concrete and a much faster runoff from roofs is very concerning for those of us on the north side of the property. I just wanted to start there and put it in context because you heard about the water issues and the house that flooded and unfortunately that was us. <laughs> All right, um, so let me say, uh, first of all, let me start by saying that uh, we understand the need for the city of Longmont to grow. And we also understand that the available lots surrounding the city are limited. So we are not opposed to development, but we are opposed to annexing this property under the current concept plan of 22 homes. All right. So let me give you a little bit of um, background. So the proposed density is not consistent or compatible with the surrounding neighborhoods on the north, west, and south side of this property. So the existing neighborhood has 11 homes that are bordering all three of those sides, and they average 11 homes on on, on an equivalent area of 8.5 acres, whereas this proposed um, annexation is 22 homes on 6.8 acres of buildable lot. So right on its face value, that is twice as dense as the surrounding uh, neighborhoods. Um, again, the lot sizes and number of houses in the proposed concept plan is not consistent and compatible with the surrounding neighborhoods. That really is my take home point on density and, and compatibility. Um, additionally, the developer and his representatives have been resistant to provide any information on the size, style, materials, landscaping and open space plans, and even price for the proposed homes in this community. Now, the, the response we get is it's too early in, in the process to be discussing that. However, how can we make a determination that this neighborhood is going to be compatible when we don't have that information at the point when annexation is being discussed? So I respect, respectfully ask this panel to vote no on annexating this property under the current concept plan of 22 homes. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Outlet. Anyone else? Hi, my name is Jordan Lane Miller. I'm at 8670 Summerlin Place. The coffin looking lot on the south that uh, abuts or it backs up to airport is the first one when they would turn into the right of way access. Um, everybody said everything that we all agree with on the one side, so I won't re repeat any of that. I just agree with it. I also think that there's just far too many things in the concept plan that haven't been considered and that pushing this forward as, as is, is uh, completely irresponsible. The, the future and the longevity of everything has just not been taken into consideration. Furthermore, in a selfish uh, perspective, the South has not been considered. I don't know if it's because there's a current uh, fence that, that is there and, and we think that it's far enough away, but really that's where the major, in everybody's gonna be impacted, but there is gonna be major impact on that South side because that's where all the cars are gonna turn into. So 22 lots with a minimum of probably two cars per lot is just an, you know, I'm seeing amount of uh, traffic into that small area. So most likely a traffic light would be then installed um, at some future point, right at that right at that access point, there's already one at Pike. It's just going to be uh, a disaster in the future, and I don't think that that's fully been thought out uh, by through this concept plan. So I would ask that um, before anything be approved, that th these things be readdressed or addressed in the first place. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Miller.
Good evening. My name is Lamie Zerwin, and I live at 2017 Sicily Circle in the Somerset Meadows subdivision. I hadn't intended to speak, but I thought I, I might. Um, if you look online, Somerset Meadows is listed as the top neighborhood in the entire Longmont area, or at least one of them. So we take great pride in our neighborhood, the custom homes, the beautiful surroundings, the open space that we enjoy, the tranquility, the peace. So when I look at this subdivision, um, I actually am looking at it in total because the applicant is also looking to annex and develop the parcel immediately to the east, 80 acres, and put in 300 mixed-use homes. Now, I understand we need to have development in our neighborhood, in our areas, but um, it would totally change the character of our area and Southwest Longmont. The applicant has also refused to um, provide any pricing uh, throughout the conversations. I don't know what it'll be like in two years. Well, certainly you know what it is right now. Certainly you've done cost projections in one year, in two years. Certainly he can say, based on current standards and market conditions, this is the pricing I anticipate. This is the price for the affordable homes I project now. Realizing that in one or two years, the market may go up, the market may go down. But to say nothing at all is disingenuous. So I guess my point here is let's preserve what we have as best we can. I echo some of the other sentiments said here today. There are areas in Longmont ripe for development. There are areas, as I drive north on Hover, that are so depressed. Can we not hold those landlords accountable? Or would take them away, build beautiful, beautiful residences, uh, affordable housing, et cetera. But for this area, so reuse, re recycle, redevelop our, our community. And for this community, please preserve what we have and what we enjoy right now. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Hello, I'm uh, Charles Musgrave. I live at 2112 Summerlin Drive. Um, we moved to this area 15 years ago from California, where we lived on a house on a 5,000 acre, uh, sorry, 5,000 square foot lot. I have direct experience with the quality of life of living on a 5,000 square foot lot. One of the reasons we came here and chose the particular neighborhood that we chose is because we knew that these larger lots would create a, a better quality of life for me and my family. Um, I am a member of the Longmont Sustainability Advisory Board and also make, and we also uh, make recommendations to this city council um, on issues re regarding uh, sustainability. Um, some of the questions about, uh, that we've discussed tonight revolve around sustainability. I have concerns about sustainability related to this uh, proposal to annex this, this parcel. Um, those include, um, and the comments that have already been made, I won't repeat those. I think my neighbors did a great job expressing our concerns. Uh, I'll add just a couple of comments about this. Uh, one is that um, we've had conversations with Platte River Power Authority. Um, this will add to the load that, uh, and demand that uh, Platte River Power Authority is commissioned to uh, deliver to the city residents. And um, <clears throat> I know it's a, only a small development but I didn't become overweight by choosing what I ate last night. It was a series of decisions over the last several years. And so the environment that you create by the recommendations that you give to the city council um, for the living conditions here in the city are gonna be made by a series of these decisions. This one decision by increasing the load on Platte River Power Authority is going to, um, one part of it, as we do that, Platte River is considering delaying, taking offline hydrocarbon powered uh, sources, their peaker plants, their um, <clears throat> reciprocal engine uh, plants that they were going to um, take offline sooner, but because of the increased load in general, because of, of high demand 
and additional development, they were considering uh, delaying those, taking those offline. Uh, one other thing, I'm on um, the 119 uh, Transportation Corridor Community Advisory Board for the County of Boulder. And we have looked at uh, proposals for modifying the 119 corridor, which includes uh, many different aspects. But we've looked in the, the most critical aspects of those are the intersections at the various places where 119 crosses arterial roads that, that cross it. Um, airport and 119 is a critical intersection. We've spent the most time on, it's the most challenging. And uh, the county most recent proposal is drastic in terms of what they're considering doing to that intersection at 119 and airport. Um, part of the issue is just the configuration. There's a creek, that tank creek that flows right through there, but it's also the traffic load and the directionality of that traffic load. In the mornings, it's heading south uh, towards Boulder, and in the evenings, it's heading north. Uh, there was a major uh, reconstruction of that intersection with an underpass that was put in uh, not too long ago. Um, it helped in some measures, but a big problem is the amount of traffic that's heading, uh, especially north in the afternoons. The loading lanes are already pretty much filled up, and um, every additional development, this is a small one, but we, every one of these is a decision in the wrong direction of overloading our infrastructure and actually uh, impacting the safety of these intersections. Uh, as again, uh, that intersection, we've spent an enormous amount of time reviewing it, looking at it, um, I'm not sure if the Planning Commission has spoken with um, the county about the considerations for that intersection. I think it would be a good idea, especially before you make any recommendation to the City Council on annex annexing this parcel. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Musgrave. Anyone else? Okay, without seeing anyone else, I'll go ahead and close the public invited to be heard section of this agenda item, uh, which then brings it back to the commission uh, for deliberation. Don't all jump at once. Forgive me, they're all popping up. Uh, Commissioner Kohler. Uh, I have another question for uh, Don. Um, so it, before I asked, you know, how I guess set in stone these concept plans have to be before annexation, but I, I have, I guess, sort of a similar question in that, um, how much do they have to have developed at this stage before annexation? Like, do you feel like the amount of detail that they've provided prior to the annexation is comparable for a typical annexation? You know, the, a lot of the public mentioned that they haven't quite thought out the drainage issues, um, things like that, but would you, would you agree with that? Vice Chair Goldenberg and uh, Commissioner Kohler, the standards that we have for a concept plan varied greatly. Um, in general, somebody could submit a concept plan that just identified density, uh, zoning, and really that's about it. Um, in my review of projects that we've gotten through the city, we have had projects that are very detailed um, at a site plan level where they know exactly what they want to do and how they want to do it to the bubble diagrams where it's just a this is single family residential it's approximately seven acres in size and we're going to build it at five units to the acre or three units to the acre so what I what I can tell you is that the concept plan itself would still require them to meet the codes that we have in place. So for example, if we have a requirement for a buffer from say Airport Road, for example, they would still have to provide that buffer or get a variance through a public hearing, which again would come back to the Planning Commission. 
for the preliminary plat as an example. So what I can tell you is that when we're doing our reviews, we can really only review at a concept level the amount of detail that they have and provide as much feedback and information on how it complies currently with the codes that are shown. Um, I know that some of the issues that have been talked about tonight are again typically things that we would look at when we get into the preliminary plot. Um, but I'm trying to go back through the notes here real quick and, and identify if there was anything that I felt that was that was lacking or missing that, that we should have maybe asked for. But I I'd have to, I'm, I wrote those down. I'll have to take another quick read here. But again, from our standpoint, the development guide that spells out the standards for what's on the concept plans is meant to be general. Uh, I actually have a couple questions for Don as well. Don, um, I think I want to start with uh, whether or not this development would necessarily impact drainage negatively in uh, in the surrounding developments. Is that a, is that a given? Is Uh, Commissioner Tata, um, I'm going to ask Jim to uh, provide his expertise uh, in the engineering world. I think it's important right. to understand the difference between the existing conditions and then future development. So, Vice Chair Goldberg. Uh, Commissioner Tetta. Um, so when you look at the site for drainage, I think we Don had, had brought it up a number of times. Um, they haven't as part of this, this submission, have not provided any of the drainage design for this site. Um, and they will be required as part of it, as we, if the application moves forward, to, to lay out um, the, de, the, their drainage design. Um, they'd be required to have a detention pond, which would have a water quality component. And then, you know, as part of the, the city's review, we'd be looking at that overall drainage plan, what they're doing with it, and how it would impact the existing infrastructure, um, both upstream and downstream. Um, as I understand it, a portion of this site would uh, flows currently flows to a swale on Airport Road, and then I think the what I've what I've been advised by staff is a majority of it flows to the north. Um, but that that's the existing conditions. So once they redevelop it, they would be required uh, through a detention stormwater management system to control their releases of that of, from this site to either equal to or less than. Uh, pre-development conditions. Don, I, I got another, a really good one for you this time. I, I, when we began tonight, you talked about compatibility and the, uh, I thought you did a really good job, but I need to hear it again. Can we replay the tape? Um, you, you know, um, Commissioner Tetta and uh, Commission, you know, I, I wrote down um, one of the comments that uh, one of the neighbors made here, and I'm trying to give him credit for it. I believe it was Mr. Hallman uh, on Glen Eyre. You know, he, he talked about compatibility being important based on the nature and extent of the existing neighborhood and the impact on them. And these are, these are the issues that we run into whenever we deal with this compatibility standard, whether it be in a new development like this or whether it be with someone who comes into Old Town and wants to redevelop a lot and it's in a, a historic neighborhood. And determining compatibility, what I look at and determine to be compatible versus what someone who lives in that neighborhood or s yourself or the city council determines is really, it, it, it's up to you. There, it, it is not a, a solid, you know, defined standard where we can say, yep, it, you check these three boxes and it's compatible. It, it is something that is looked at probably on a case-by-case -case basis by every one of us. 
And so I understand their concerns. I do. From what I try to look at from compatibility, at least at an annexation standpoint, one is how did we identify the property for bringing it in with the Envision Longmont Comprehensive Plan, which is the single family uh, residential kind of development. The density that they're proposing is within the range that the comprehensive plan allows. Granted, it could be lower. It also could be higher. Again, that's the question. Is it compatible? And then we also have to think about that, you know, we do have housing needs uh, in the community. We are trying to provide variety of housing for people to be able to move to Longmont and provide houses for people. And that compatibility is always a question that we run into. And so tonight, you know, I don't envy you. This is, this is a tough decision. And making that decision on that review criteria is something that you guys are probably gonna have to discuss and really weigh. And again, if there are conditions that you think would address compatibility, those are things that you could put in. You know, I've we heard from um, a number of individuals, but I think uh, Mr. Rothschild talking about the fencing, uh, the, um, the landscaping requirements and things of that nature around the perimeter of that property to help to buffer and reduce the impact on the neighborhoods. Those are things too that you could look at. Um, maybe those are things that the applicant can commit to, that those could then be conditions that you would recommend to the city council to address compatibility. So again, it's, it's tough. It, it is, and I know it is. And, but from my standpoint, our staff standpoint, we believe that based on the criteria that we have, we think it is compatible in this specific location. You're welcome. Hey, Don, I think I have a few more questions for you. Sorry for making you up and down. Yeah. Uh, you might pass these off to Jim, but... Um, okay, so uh, thanks to Commissioner Teda, I think we he reinforced that much of the questions and concerns around drainage just won't be addressed today. Uh, okay. This is something that will be reviewed in the future, and it's really not part of our purview today. I'm not going to want to speak for Mr. Engstep, but I, I think what he has pointed out is that there's an existing condition right now, whether this property is developed or not, that is impacting the development to the north. What is causing that, I don't know that we know, um, but the releases historically that have come off of this site, as I understand it in his explanation, will need to be continued moving forward if the project is developed that that same rate of release that same impact would continue right at development this is saying that whatever current flow is coming off the property now it cannot increase as a result of this of a new development is that accurate it ha they're obligated to it's keep the levels down. the same that's where i step back and say my <laughs> night at the holiday and express stops right there i, I can't speak to that So, so basically, yes, that is correct, uh, Chair Goldberg. That 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 the the amount of or the the rates of of pre development flows going leaving the site currently uh, in post development has to be equal to or less. Okay, one of our applicants, and I think it was Mr. Wilson, identified or suggested that the culvert to the east it may be obstructed or blocked and, and as a result we're seeing backflow even on rainy days like yesterday how do we maintain our culverts how do we get a culvert uh, cleared if it's backed up what can a resident do to say hey we got an issue over here um chair goldberg the uh the culverts in this case a culvert under um, Airport Road is the responsibility of uh, City of Longmont's Public Works um, Natural Resources Department, specifically our operations division. 
So if we're made aware of it, uh, they will will inspect it, and then in some cases they either go out physically and clean it out, or they will uh, jet out, uh, use a jet truck to to clean it out. Um, so there is is uh, is an ability, uh, and it is the responsibility of the city of Longmont. I think that might. Okay, is that public works team aware of this potential backup? Has there been? Is it flagged or tagged to be evaluated? Um, I don't know if it is or not, but it will be by tomorrow. Okay. This is proof to our folks who come and speak to us that we're listening and action will, will be taken. Um, while I have you, uh, Jim, a discussion came up about the intersection at airport and 119. Do we have visibility into what is the status of that intersection? Um, Forgive me, I think it was one of the last speakers, uh, uh, maybe Mr. Musgrave, uh, said that that intersection is really tricky and potentially w with developments coming down the line, including this one, may have impacts on that. What is the rating of that intersection? And well, let me stop with that. So that intersection is actually in Boulder County uh, on a CDOT roadway. So I do not, do not have any uh, information off the top of my head. It is not included in the traffic study. Um, it is over three quarters of, three, two thirds of a mile away from, from this site. So I don't believe they needed to include it. Um, that is information I'd have to pull together and see if we have uh, any information on it in, in our files. But I do not have anything off the top of my head, no. Would that be, would three quarters of a mile be included in a traffic study in the future, in this future, um assessments that the applicant will have to complete? Um, I don't believe it would be. Okay, so this particular intersection is really, again, outside of our purview for tonight, potentially not even a part of the evaluation of the process by the city at all because it's not in the area. That is correct. Okay, thanks. While I have you up, this might be a question for Don. Okay. Who owns the road? One of the... Um, applicants or one of the members of the public asked a question. Maybe Mr. Broida and Mr. Zan said, "There's a 40-acre strip on the south side that we don't know who, and we don't know who owns it. Who owns the road, Don? Is this foiling our application or our annexation review?" So let me give you a little history. Uh, I. I, one, I don't think I'm going to be able to answer the question. Um, I have an opinion, but I, I don't think I can answer the question, and I don't think you want my opinion. So um, the, the, if, if I understand what everybody is talking about, there was an outlot. There were two outlots that were along the south edge of these two properties that was dedicated as right-of-way when the Somerset Meadows development was approved. There's an existing access easement across this property, mostly for emergency access, but this area was specifically called out in the plat as road, road right-of-way. And it makes sense if I had the larger picture, this was the, there was only one way into this development and there was no development that had already built, for example, Renaissance Drive that comes down to the south here through the Somerset development right now. There may have been Clover Basin because we started to get some of the apartments and some of the McStain developments up near um, Amgen at the time, now I can't remember the name of the company, forgive me. Um, but it was a part of this, this development when it was platted that you're seeing here that I'm kind of outlining here in the yellow. The area was annexed to the city, and so when it was annexed and developed, if it's right of way, it's typically given to the city of Longmont then for ownership. As I recall, when the property owners that own the two lots 
came in, and this was probably, I would say probably 10 years ago. It was probably 2005. Um, they came in and made a request <coughs> to vacate the rights, the right of way that was there. And so I think what I'm understanding, and I don't want to put words in the, in the public's mouth, but what I believe I'm hearing is that the question is whether or not this right of way when it was vacated then should go back to this development because that's where it, it came from. And I, and I think there's something to be investigated on that for sure. But if you pull up the original document that actually created the two lots of this Westview subdivision that was done a long time ago, it actually laid out not only these properties, but it laid out, I believe it was three or four other lots in this whole area that became a part of the Somerset development. So as I understand the state statute, when they look at giving back right of way, it goes back to the parent parcel from which the property originally orig originated from. So my understanding is that when we vacated this, Boulder County determined and included these outlots into their legal descriptions because they believed that that's where it originated from. We did not make that decision as a city. The county made that decision. If there is an error, obviously we would want that corrected, and I'm assuming that uh, Jack would want that corrected as well. The, the title commitment, obviously, is, is the first place that they should start looking to confirm, and I think that it's probably a safe thing for us to try to figure out before we get to a city council public hearing. But that's, that's my general understanding and explanation of the stuff that has happened over out here from a long time ago. Uh, so just to follow up on that a little bit. So you're saying that the parent lot was, were actually the lots to the south? not in this annexation, or did I misunderstand that? No, so the original, what I would consider the parent from the meadow view that created the lot where this tail came from included roughly all of this area that is the summer set annexation or development and these two lots that are the Westview Acre subdivision that we're looking at tonight. Okay. And I guess maybe, it, it, unless you had something else, I would follow up on that as well. So if it, so I, and maybe this is a question for the applicant, if this goes the other way, say that, that right away ends up being belonging to the homeowners, the existing homeowners, can this concept plan be preserved as it is in the annexation process, or does that change the plans too much? I, I think the applicant needs to comment on, on that from, from their standpoint, okay. just because of the numbers that they need to make the project work. So I defer to Jack. Commissioner Goldberg uh, and Commissioner Kohler. Um, we've heard this assertion before about property and we were very careful when we transacted this process and our title commitment, our surveyors, our attorneys, we looked at this a couple years ago very carefully. And basically what Don just outlined is correct. In other words, Westview Acres was actually a part of Somerset. It was, it was all part of the one, same subdivision. So in the state statute is 432-3021A because I thought this might come up. I've responded to this on April 21st in the comments responding to letters from some of the neighbors. But basically that assertion has no basis and our attorney would tell you that if he was here. Uh, at, the, at the time of dedication, outlots F and H, those are the two, were side by side along the south edge. They were vacated in 2005 and they were immediately, they went to lots one and two because the state statute, that's, that's how the land gets divided or, or added to uh, so they complied with, with the state statute, and 
Um, the question about whether um, we could make the concept plan work without them is kind of moot. Uh, you know, we, I suppose you could. I mean, we could make we could make an access. We know that the access needs to be where we have it there. After our traffic engineer and the, and the city has required that, but I really I think this assertion is, you know, it's it's another way of kind of trying to constrain the process, and we don't think it has any basis. And our title company doesn't think it has any basis. So that's that's important. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Pistol. <clears throat> So Don, it sounds like the applicant is at least confident that this, uh, so I'm, forgive me, I want to apologize to the public, but we had the designated public invited to be heard section, and once that closes, this no longer becomes a discussion with the public, it's be between the applicant, the staff, and the commission. Uh, so unfortunately, we're not permitted to bring up, um, bring back up the public. It's. It's how every meeting runs, unfortunately. So I, I see the hands and I apologize. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so I think just to continue with my train of thought, it sounds like the applicant is confident that this is a non-issue that they have rights, he has rights to the land and this won't come up in the future. Admittedly, I'm a little surprised that like, we didn't have this really clearly baked out from our own city staff, you know, review, you know, that we're sitting here today and it's still kind of open. Can you just give a little confidence so that I, I, I'm being a little playful here, but can you give us a little confidence in that we should be proceeding with this discussion because this land is this is all part of this project, and someone else doesn't own it. And Chairman Goldberg, I can only tell you, based on the information that we have been, we have seen from the research that we have done, and then from the information that the applicant has submitted, no one has submitted anything official okay. that would either be something through our city attorney's office or submitted to us that we would give to the attorney's office sure. to indicate that the ownership is not correct. And so that is what we are going off of. And at this time, I believe it is true and factual. Okay. You said it might be, you, you suggested that it be confirmed between now and when we're sitting, when it's before city council. Can we rest assured that that will happen sometime between now and then? So what I would like to ask the applicant to do, I can do it now, I guess, while I'm staying here, but um, I would have done it afterwards, was that if they have any opinion from their attorney that, that we could get something like that just for clarity. And to the people in the audience that feel they may have a claim themselves, obviously if you have legal representation that you believe is something that we should consider, then please don't sit on that, please submit that so that we can review it and present it to our legal staff for, for review. So that, that's my answer back to the, the public is, if you have something you believe is, shows it different, please submit that to us because I don't have anything at this time. Okay, yeah, thanks Don, I appreciate that and, and I appreciate calling it out to our guests here today who are very engaged and commit, you know, dedicated to this project and protecting their, neighborhood, there are options for them between now and October to um, take action. But before you sit down, Don, let me um, ask a few more questions. There was a few uh, mentions about a future development that's in the works, uh, 300 properties or more nearby. Yes. Before I ask you to expand on that anymore, can we take future projects or future developments into consideration when we're reviewing this um, project before us? Are we permitted to consider future developments? I, Chairman Goldberg, I would, might ask Katasi to, to, to weigh in from a, a, a legal standpoint on that for you. I have an opinion, but I would probably defer to her. 
So thanks, Don. Forgive me. Is it Attorney Atasi or Counsel Atasi? Would you mind guiding us here? I'm inclined to learn more about the proposed project. It sounds like it's a lot of properties. It's nearby. Certainly impacts to the surrounding neighborhood. But are we permitted to use future development, potential development in our consideration for this annexation today? So Atasi Titlow from the City Attorney's Office. I'm an Assistant City Attorney that's sitting in for Eugene May today or tonight. Um, with regard to the question, as it as for future development and you know the 300 homes, you can consider that for drainage purposes, things like that, where it would affect the development that you know. But as far as what we have here today, what we need to focus on is what the applicant has presented, what the staff has presented, what the public has presented to you. And so, you know, we, we do want to keep it within the confines of what we are discussing here today. Okay. So, again, in the future, if this annexation continues and it moves on to phases where the drainage is more thoroughly reviewed, this would be the time that we would consider other surrounding projects that may impact it. Potentially, But yes. not today. Correct. Potentially. I mean, there's not, you know... With regard to these future developments, I mean, it could go from 300 to 150 just based on the market. I mean, there are so many variables. And so that's why, you know, we want to try and keep it within the confines of what we're discussing today. Okay. Thank you. Hey, Don. Why no right turn? And I could put, I could put this up to Jim if that's better. Um, Mr. De La Lama, Jim, I'll give you a second. Mr. De La Lama is asking why there's no right turn recommended or required into this development. Other properties in and along um, airport have right turns. It sounds like it's really busy in the morning hours and in the evening hours. Why didn't our traffic, or maybe we're not there yet, why haven't we recommended um, a right turn into the neighborhood? I think the, the primary reason is this is a small development. It is 22 units. It, right. it generates 200 trips a day. Um, the, so it doesn't meet the trigger for, uh, that is in our design standards Got it. for a right turn. Um, it, there, there are traffic studies showing like nine, nine turns in there in the peak hour. Um, and for a road like Airport Road, um, you'd need, oh geez, there's, there's a chart in there or a, a graph. Um, and for, for like a thousand trips, vehicles per hour, you'd have to have at least 10 right turns. And they only, the, the projections on Airport Road are only showing about a maximum, maybe 300 uh, per hour um, per lane. So it doesn't hit that. Okay. Based on looking at that, doesn't hit the, won't hit, will not hit the triggers even in 2041. Okay, so there is a review process. It's been reviewed and considered. It doesn't hit the trigger, so therefore we didn't require or recommend a right turn. That is correct. Okay, thanks. I have one more question, and then I'll yield it to Commissioner Lukacs. Um, hey, Don, there was a question about the impact on Platte Power Water Authority. Uh, can we, should we be considering potential impacts to Platte Power Water Authority? Am I saying that right? Power it's Authority? Power. Platte, yeah. Platte Power. Platte River. Platte River Power, Platte River Power Authority. Authority. Forgive me. I knew there was a water body in there. Um, should we be considering Platte River Power Authority's, um, the impact to this entity um, in our uh, review today? Uh, Chairman Goldberg, I. Uh, you do, and um, and you should. But what I would say is that the thing to understand is that we're one of the four members that own the Platte River Power Authority. Um, our city electric department, Longmont Power and Communications, they review all of the annexations. They review all of the developments for impacts on the system. And then they use that information when they're doing their modeling and they send that information to Platte River Power when they're putting together their projections. So last night when they were here presenting to the city council and talking about their rates and how they set those and when they look out and they set it out for the next 10 year period 
and I think they mentioned a 40% increase in costs, I think is, was the number that I heard last night. Um, I was kind of doing a couple things there, but sure. but again, they they are not a quote unquote referral. We are not sending it to them sure. for comment and feedback. Our sure. staff works with them and keeps them in <coughs> in the know of what's going on. So by the way that we operate, by the way our development review committee works, they they are up to speed on what's going on. And they would then consider these in any kind of rate increases or impacts to the loads during the summer. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Don. Um, Commissioner Lukach, I apologize for that long wait. <coughs> and you stole one of my questions. <laughs> but I do have a, a question for Jim um, and about traffic. <laughs> But uh, this time is more about uh, pedestrians and, and bicycles. It looks like there will be um, a sidewalk there or some sort of multi-use path along uh, along that side of the airport road. Uh, currently there is none, right? There's just one on the east side. So how would someone cross the street, someone that lives in there? Will they have to go all the way up to to what street? <laughs> Chair Goldberg. Um, to Pike, yeah. yeah Commissioner Lakash, um, that would be basically the, the, the safest crossing, uh, um, controlled crossing. Yes. Um, airport Road is, uh, this is on the, can pretty much the outskirts of the city, this is, is Airport Road is an arterial. Um, so currently, um, as this area develops uh, in the future, there may be, opportunities for an underpass. Uh, mm -hmm. Currently, we do not have anything planned in the CIP for this. Um, but um, what, you know, there will be a sidewalk installed uh, along their frontage. Um, and then we will figure out, work out how to get it connected up to, into the, the, the remainder of Airport Road and that, that uh, sidewalk system up there. Um, but currently, um, crossing of Airport Road, the safest area would be Pike Road. And so it will go all the way up to Pike because we couldn't see from from the well the sidewalk. There's there's currently a sidewalk from um, I'm trying to think of the street immediately to the north to the north, but between this this Glenire. development yeah between this development um, there's a short segment that does not have sidewalk. So we'd have to work out how to figure out how to get that connected in. And that will be done during this project. I. <laughs> Not exactly sure. Uh, the city does have a missing sidewalk um, CIP that we, mm -hmm. we, we take on projects of this nature. Uh, it may be that we, um, as we do the review, we may require the developer to do it. Um, I, at this stage, we haven't, I don't think the staff has looked at it close enough. I think the applicant, are you going to say something? <laughs> Uh, Jim's staff is requiring us to extend the sidewalk up to Glen Eyre. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. We hate those people. No, we don't. on now? Okay. Thank you, Chair. I just want to point out um, a few observations that I have made, which should be obvious, but I just want to state them. Um, this proposed subdivision does not dump any traffic into the adjacent subdivisions. The um, the road is self-contained within the subdivision, and it doesn't go anywhere else. Um, another observation is that the applicant, after meeting with homeowners and listening to their complaints, um, did adjust the concept plan 
particularly on the west side to eliminate the road that was on the west side. And they adjusted the lots on the west side to be quite compatible with the lots in the Somerset Meadows uh, that abut them. Um, another observation is that the 11 lots that abut this proposed subdivision all face away from it. They're showing their backside to this subdivision. And their views, presumably, like everybody's views, are to the west. And they're certainly not to Airport Road. And they may consider that they have some views into this proposed parcel, but really their views are to the mountains and to the west. Um, those are just some observations that I wanted to offer up as um, just a response to non-compatibility. As far as the traffic concerns, certainly uh, the future uh, development over on the east side of airport is going to be a much bigger concern. Um, we're only talking 22 lots here. And as far as compatibility, this, um, this subdivision is probably somewhere in between the large lots that are existing and what's going to be proposed on the east side of airport. That's it. Just some observations. Thank you. Um, another question for Don, I think, in general, when you're looking at combat compatibility, what have you seen in the past about how far out an area you're looking at? Because all the maps we've looked at tonight are pretty zoomed in on this, these parcels and these 11 ho homes surrounding them. But you don't have to go very far out to get kind of a different perspective. You know, to the northeast, I would say the density is much higher, even very far to the west. You maybe get something similar to what's being proposed. But, you know, how big of an area are, are, do you think we need to consider when we're talking compatibility? Uh, Chairman Goldberg and uh, Commissioner Kohler, um, I think the commission can look at the neighborhood. Um, you know, the neighborhood and how it's defined really is going to vary, you know, I may define it as my neighborhood that I live in and not including everybody else um, as subdivisions around me. But I think that, you know, the, the commission could look outside of the area and say that this area of Longmont is developed at three units to the acre and this is compatible with that area, with, with the larger area. I don't have those numbers for you to be able to, to give you those right now, right offhand. Um, and again, not knowing, but I think you are right, you know, uh, to the northeast, the uh, development that is kind of in the right-hand corner of that aerial, those are smaller lots um, that were developed uh, back in around 1999, roughly. Um, and then as you go back across the street, you get into some of the apartment townhomes, but then as you get into this development into Somerset and then over into the Renaissance neighborhoods, obviously get into smaller lots again, and those have changed over the years as prices have gone up. And I, I think the, the desire for more density, at least from the development side, but also trying to provide additional housing within the community has been a priority. So um, you can look outside of the box that I've drawn. I zoomed in so that you could have a visual that would show you a little bit more of the proximity of these homes and their properties to this development application. Thank you. <laughs> oh. uh, yeah, uh, forgive the interruption here, but I think as we approach 11 p.m., thanks Commissioner Teta for the reminder, uh, we actually have to kind of pause the discussion and vote as a commission to uh, extend beyond the 11 o'clock hour. 
Is that right, Jane? Um, so I don't think there's anything more formal than I think we need someone to make a motion and then vote as to whether we want to um, extend or not. Does anyone want to make a motion? I think just to preface it, um, I think what we're charged with doing is deciding whether or not we think we can resolve it all tonight or it's not going to happen whether we stay for another hour and a half or not. And then we put it off to a another date certain. So um, maybe we could talk about it for a minute. Sure, go ahead. I'd stay. I think we could do it. Is that a motion? Yeah. I'll make it if nobody else has anything to say. Uh, Commissioner Boone. If we extend it to the next, if we extend it to the next meeting, um, we probably will end up going through the whole public comment section again. I don't know the policy on extending. I'm not sure we ever have extended, uh, but does that reopen public uh, public invited to be heard? Uh, I'm pointing that at Don Burchette because he's looking thoughtful. Chairman Goldberg, um, what I can tell you that has happened on other projects where we have continued them to a date certain is that whether it's been counselors or, or planning commission, they have voted to open up and give the ability for the public to speak again. I think that's been a courtesy extended to those people that show up again and to kind of respect their willingness to participate. I don't know that there is any rule that is requiring that you reopen that public hearing. Um, if you did open that up, though, I would think that you would need to allow the applicant, obviously, to um, be able to answer questions and things like that, which is kind of what we're doing right now after the last hearing. So, but I know of no obligation to have to do it. Obviously, we could research that if the commission continues it and be ready to give you a, a more formal uh, response at the start of that that meeting if you continue it. Thanks, Don. Um, you know, boy, uh, I feel like we've had a really robust um, public invited to be heard discussion today. And while I like the idea of a second opportunity for public invited to be heard to for more participation, um, I'm inclined to keep going. Um, if everyone else is, so I guess I would move to extend beyond 11 o'clock and continue the agenda items. Is there a second? I'll second, my microphone's off. All right, we have a second. Uh, Jane, can we go ahead and take a vote? Commissioner Tedda. Aye. Vice Chairman Goldberg. Aye. Commissioner Kohler. Aye. Commissioner Lukacs. Commissioner Boone, Aye. Vice Chair, that uh, passes unanimously. Thanks, Jane. Okay, um, I think I was about to hit Don with just a few more questions, and I don't see any of my fellow commissioners chiming in yet, so I don't feel too bad about it. All right. Don, what is your title? I keep calling you Don, but I feel like I should be calling you not Planning Director, but Something like that. My, my title is planning manager. Planning manager. Yeah, but you can still call me Don. Okay. One of the members of the public suggested that the way we're calculating our density of 3.2 units per acre could be almost disingenuous. Because we're taking into consideration the two larger units already on site. Are we being disingenuous? Would you mind clarifying how do we calculate the average dwelling unit and what if there are scenarios like this where some are bigger and some are small? Vice Chair, 
uh, Goldberg. Yeah, I'll, though I will mess that up again. Um, one, I'm going to show that I'm not an engineer and that my math skills are terrible. So when I tell you how to divide, I'll probably do it the opposite way. I usually have to do it twice on my calculator to get it right. Um, but what we would do is we would take the the acreage of the property, um, and then we would div and I'm like I said, I have to usually do it on my calculator to get it correct. But we would divide by the number of units that are proposed. Uh, to determine what the density per acre is then. So acres, number of acres, number of units, divide those and then that comes up with a density. And uh, if I did the order wrong, I apologize to my mathematic friends who understand that stuff better than I do. That's why I became a, a planner. Um, I would say that when we look at development across the city, and when we determine density, we look at it on the basis of the property that's under development. And it's not often that we will look at, for example, a development that may have townhomes in one area, single family homes in another, and we look at that on that entire, uh, and again, I'm gonna use probably the wrong term, it's getting late, apologize, but the gross acreage of the property and if we're specific and, for example, if we have an area that the land use changes on a property because it has multiple land uses, so for example up here, if I had a rectangle parcel that had two land uses on it, we would look at not only the overall, but then we would confirm that the densities match for the individual areas as well to make sure that those are in keeping with the boundaries that were shown on the comprehensive plan. So it, it is often that we get varying types and sizes of lots. So I don't believe it's a disingenuous way of determining what the density is for this property. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, it seems like the applicant has the leeway to build up to eight um, dwelling units per acre, but the math, like it or not, is shaking out at about 3.2. Even one of the applicants, uh, even applicants, even one of the members of the public said if you took out those two larger ones, maybe it's closer to five. But needless to say, there would be opportunity for this to be a more dense um, application or more dense development. Is that true? Yes, yeah, under our code. Um all of the lots could have been at our minimum size, which I believe is around 5,500 square feet. Um, I looked that up earlier tonight, so I apologize if it's not fresh, but if we would have knocked down the two homes and divided those two lots up, that could have been another, um, quite a few more homes just at that size of lots, so. Okay, I guess my last question, I've kind of suggested with you in the past, which is, I hate when we surprise existing homeowners with development. You know, folks move from California, you know, move from Boulder, found a sweet spot in Longmont, and it had unobstructed views, and it was a real wonderful setting, and now we're talking about putting in um, a lot with that might mess up that, that vision they have. How long has this property been developable? You know, are we are we surprising them? Are we tricking them? When did they? When should they? Or could they have found out that this land could be and would be developed further at some point? So, uh, Vice Chair Goldberg, I would say that you know, there's. There is a difference, I think, with okay. this property. If I would have moved into this area and I would have seen those two existing homes on there, I myself would have probably assumed that nothing was ever going to happen to those, even though the comprehensive plan shows the single family development. And my thinking on that would have been, who could afford to buy two, more, I'm guessing more than a million dollar each house, uh, I would guess probably multiple millions, with the size of land 
and afford to be able to either a knock them down or get enough density to make it work and probably in you know back 10 10 years ago i don't i don't think it would have penciled but right now you know we have just about built out to our planning boundary with boulder county we do not have much greenfield left that we can go to we are have agreed that they are purchasing open space we are as well outside of that blue line that's shown up there on the map and it has by doing that we've preserved a lot of great properties a lot of beautiful areas in the county but we have also created value and we have people who want to move to Colorado we have people that are coming here for jobs and for the mountains that we love and and the environment that we have and now that pencils out and I don't know that anybody if, if they would have called my office four years ago before this came in I probably would have warned them that hey right now I don't know that anything's gonna happen we don't have anything in our system but I can't guarantee you it's never gonna change so you know there's obviously buyer beware right I mean you should do your due diligence you should call and talk to the planning department and find out what is planned what could happen on a property and then you have to weigh whether or not you think it's reasonable if I would have bought there 10 years ago I wouldn't have thought this was was feasible so would that have been a surprise to me it would have been but I I would have at least known that there were opportunity for that to happen and what year were the surrounding neighborhoods built the, the members that are here tonight what year were those so yeah so Somerset is that 99? Six? Six? Okay, six. There you go. <laughs> Seems like it was only yesterday because <laughs> I remember we had issues when the banks went under back in 2008. But Okay, thanks, Don. Yeah. Commissioner Lukacs. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I think it was uh, Mr. Holman that um, brought up uh, open space and, and the buffer that is there to the north. And uh, and maybe this was said before, but it, it's been a long night. Can, can someone clarify what a buffer is? What what can be a buffer? Can open space be a buffer or does, does it need to have mature trees? Um, what can be a buffer? Never meant for this to be the Don show, but, uh, <laughs> but th thank you for putting up with me. Um, the, the land development code uh, does define types of buffers and buffers, um, I, I can look up to see if there's a specific definition in the back of the land development code, but typically these are areas that are separate out lots that then have a certain depth requirement as well as a certain number of trees and shrubs per square footage based on the type of buffer that's required. And we have an A buffer, a B buffer, a C buffer, a D buffer, and an E buffer. And kind of similar to the traffic, it gets larger as it goes down in, in, in the letter. So letter E is a required 50 foot uh, in depth buffer versus a B buffer is 20 feet. And then the amount of trees typically is increased. Trees and shrubs are required to be increased in those larger buffers to, because the impact is expected to be greater from that use on the adjacent properties. And so that's, that's how we look at buffers. And we define where those are required in the code. And uh, what, what grade are these buffers around this property? Great question. So for a residential subdivision, if adjacent to an arterial street, it requires a B buffer. So that's a that's a 20 foot buffer that's required. If it's adjacent to another existing street, that would be a local road or a collector street, it's also a 20 foot buffer. If it was next to a primary greenway, 
a public park or a public nature area, then it is also a B buffer. If it was on a gateway, so that would be Highway 119, 287, uh, Highway 66, the used to be called scenic entry buffers, those are 50 feet. And then adjacent to single family detached homes, there is no buffer required. Other against any other type of residential, there is no buffer required. So the only buffer that I see that would have to be provided would be the arterial buffer, the B buffer, the 20 foot buffer between airport and this development. Okay, thank you, Don. You're very welcome. Uh, Commissioner Ted, if you don't mind holding one second, um, I think the applicant wants to come up. I suspect it's around buffers. Yes, thank thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, it, it, in the presentation, maybe I slid through it, but that's why I suggested a denser landscape. I did not mention a privacy fence. Obvi I think that's obvious, but we're all about what they were suggesting. More vegetation. A privacy fence, six feet, you know, whatever that, that is, a good quality one. When I met with Mr. Rothschild at his house, we talked about what kind it would be, and I think we talked about the Summerlin one as an example. And, um, you know, when we talked about removing the road next, you know, which ne next to his property. Um, and, and I think that's what was on those diagrams. You know, we, we think it's... You think it only makes sense. I'm not sure it has to be a separate outlaw, but it could be just the way the, the rear lots are densely densely planted in the, in the, uh, the fencing. So we're, we're supportive of that. Thank you. Maybe stay up there for just one second. Uh, Mr. Bestall, are you done? Okay. Uh, one more second, Commissioner Teta. Um, Mr. Bestall, thanks for... Um, you know, discussing this and, and uh, acknowledging the neighbor's concerns about the buffers. Uh, we Yes, we certainly heard from Mr. De La Lama and um, Mr. Rothschild specifically around buffers, not only just, bu not only buffers, but buffers during construction as well, I think is what I heard. Um, while you just said it, I wonder if I can just ask you directly, um, if we were to put a condition in the in our uh, recommendation to city council, would you be willing to accommodate and work with you know, and work with the city staff, working with the neighborhood, to provide you know robust, adequate buffers in the form of trees, shrubs, and privacy fences between your property and the surrounding properties? Absolutely. Okay. Thanks. Okay, um, Commissioner Ted. All right, a couple things. Um, I wanted some clarification on something. Maybe Glenn might know the answer. The um, Somerset development is in the city, and the Summerlin development is in the county, but not in the city. Is that right? Of course, Don's going to know that one. I don't know. Don, my question, Somerset in the city, Summerlin in the county, but not in the city. Correct. Okay. And both of these are adjacent developments. Yes, right. they are. Okay. That's correct. Um, the, uh, the other thing I just wanted to add that it's just a rumor perhaps, but I had heard that the um, consideration to the airport – and 119 intersection was that it might get shut down to eastbound turning from from airport. So if you entered 119 from airport, you would no longer be able to go east to Longmont at that intersection. So if you wanted to go east, potentially, I know it's just a rumor, but you'd then have to snake back through the... Uh, Developments on the east side of airport via Pike, perhaps to Fordham, to then go east. Um, I think 
going forward, all of the things that are proposed for that section of Airport Road on either side between 119 and Pike could wind up then being a little problematic if that's something that you would have to do. But that's just hearsay probably at this point. Uh, thanks, Commissioner Teta. Uh, Don or uh, Jim, uh, can anyone speak to the future plans for um, Longmont bound traffic on the diagonal at the airport and the diagonal intersection? Uh, Chair Goldberg, my understanding is that um, at that intersection, the, um, I want to say northbound traffic approaching Longmont will still be able to turn left to go north onto Airport Road. Um, the proposal currently is to make that a one-way street between the diet sections of the diagonal because it is separated there. Um, so that they do not, because what they're seeing is with, with accidents and some of the counts, um, with the future BRT project, uh, bus rapid transit, they're going to be, they would need, if they don't do an adjustment there, would need to add another traffic signal, and that's not what the county wants to do. So it would be one way going northbound in that little segment, segment um, so that somebody coming south on Airport Road would not be able to continue um, to go towards Longmont. That can you provide clarify. a 100%? Um, can you clarify what is the proposed resolution for that? Just rerouting through the airport to get yourself back into Longmont? I think what the, what the if I recall, and it was just from a brief presentation with the county, was that they would anticipate that there would be turnarounds on the diagonal further south on their way to Boulder where, where traffic would be able to turn around. Uh, pull a U-turn through across the the open space area there that they would provide that. That was my understanding. Got it. Turn right on the diagonal from airport. And go then, some yeah. distance and then, distance and then a have to left turn. turn yes. U-turn. Okay. Thanks. Okay. I don't see any um, members of the commission with their light on, uh, so maybe we're just catching our breath here. Um, I'll chime in just for a second or two. <laughs> Where do I start? Uh, boy, high level, I, it's really hard for me to find a reason not to. There's lots of reasons that we've heard, and there's lots of concerns, and there's lots of um, real, palpable, visible, tangible concerns from the neighborhood and we've heard them and, re and, and referenced most of you by name, hopefully. Um, but I'm struggling to find a real, re a legitimate reason for us to not make the recommendation for annexation to city council. I think the work ahead of us is more on what can we put into that recommendation that ensures we address the concerns um, of those who came out today. Um, some of the issues can't be addressed right now. Drainage, we recognize, will come later. Specifics on the building materials will come later. Pricing on the units will come later. There's lots of things that just are not in the purview of the annexation review you know, in consideration. So it's not that w those won't be addressed. They just can't be addressed today. It's not why we're here today. But I do think there's probably a few things that we can put into our recommendation to city council um, if we recommend to approve that um, will help protect and um, take into consideration the feedback we've heard today. Um, so that's kind of where my head is. Uh, let me... Uh, uh, toss it over to Co Commissioner Kohler. Okay, so I would agree with you on that. I, I think we could, well, I would hope that we could tailor some conditions to hopefully address some of the concerns that the public has raised here, even maybe if they're generic, and, and maybe, Don, you can respond to this, if, if we could even include a condition that says, you know, drainage has to be 
thoroughly considered or something, you know, generic like that, just to make sure it gets its its review. Um, and then I would also like to consider the option of requiring the privacy fence and the landscape buffers, I think, on all three sides for the to, to move this forward to city the city council. Commissioner Lukacs. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I agree with the uh, Commissioner Kohler uh, with the with the pri privacy fence, and I believe um, at least the neighborhood, from from what I recall, just passing by, it, it has a, um, a tall enough fence. Of it. There's like a brick wall there, uh, so um, I don't know if it needs more fencing, but but if that's the desire. Um, I'm in favor of that. And I think the, the applicant, you know, as far as density, uh, you know, they could have gone with eight units per acre, right? Because it's a single family neighborhood. So they, they went way down. Um, and um, I'm, in, I'm in favor of this project with, with some conditions. Thank you, Commissioner Lukacs. Uh, Commissioner Teta? Well, I'm really struggling with the compatibility. Um, as you may or may not know, I've got really intimate uh, knowledge of this area. And I have typically celebrated the diversity of housing types that um, have been successful over there from the, you know, the apartments on the corner of Pike and Airport and the... Uh, um, multifamily houses uh, further west on Pike. Um, all of the uh, apartments on Grandview Meadows. Uh, they they all seem to work really wonderfully in this area, in a way that hasn't typically been done, where housing types have been segregated. Um, but I, I can't help but feel that the, uh, the, the design and density of this particular neighborhood, and it may just be a harbinger of, of what's going to happen everywhere around there, but it doesn't feel, to me, compatible, mostly in terms of lot size. It just feels very different than what is all around it. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Teta. Um, Commissioner Boone. Thank you. I acknowledge the compatibility questions. Um, however, I think the applicant has met the standards that are needed to move this annexation forward with the conditions that were discussed for buffering. That's all. Commissioner Kohler. I'll, I'll just add, I, I, I had similar struggles with the compatibility issue, again, when I looked at this pretty closely. Um, but if you zoom out very far, it actually feels like this, just as Commissioner Teta mentioned, is a good diverse mix, and it, it kind of plays into that. You know, you really have a whole range of, of types of homes in this area, and this, to me, just seems like yet, yet another piece in this bigger picture of, of diversity. Shoot, Commissioner Teta, I, I hear you loud and clear on the compatibility. Um, it's hard. It, it's hard. The project is not at the maximum density that it could be at. That's stated in our comp plan. Um, the applicant downsized the number of um, units based on uh, what he or they could have done. Um, we're hearing senses of cooperation. And we have to be mindful of the needs of our town. And we didn't, I didn't ask Don to discuss, you know, the latest housing availability in Longmont, but I think 
it goes without saying that um, we we need development, we need housing. Uh, you know, we have folks that can't live and work in Longmont, and um, so there's a gap we hear it time and time again. And so this is addressing a need um, that is well established and isn't going to change anytime soon. So I'm finding comfort in the compatibility um, piece. Here, I was a little concerned as to how to proceed discussing uh, conditions until there was a motion on the table because I didn't want to be presumptuous that we were going to approve or recommend approval or not. Uh, but I've heard several members of the commission suggest their support. Um, so then with that, maybe I'll turn to Don for a little guidance here. Uh, I heard a couple of things that I think we can confirm. One is addressing barriers, fencing, tree buffers, shrub, shrubbery. So I'm going to ask you for your help with that, Don. Um, does it go without saying that we'll address the land ownership, that strip of land between now and when the city council um, makes their final decision? Or should I put in the condition that the applicant and city staff resolve or address, confirm, you know, the ownership um, question at hand. Does that need to be addressed? So, Vice Chair Goldberg, I, I think if I'm sitting in your position, I would make that as a condition. Okay. I, I, I think it's a reasonable condition, and obviously we will continue to investigate and as I've explained to the audience, if they have something that they believe is contrary, they need to submit it to us because we want to figure this out. This is not something that we want to deal with at a public hearing before the city council. Sure. So um, if that makes the commission feel comfortable <laughs> in that and again, reflects the, the importance of it, I think it's a, it's a valid condition. Okay, and then the third item that I have down as a potential condition um, speaks to drainage. However, I think we heard that the review criteria later on will say that and the applicant will need to prove that there's no increased drainage burden on the neighbors at a future time. Do we need to include a condition that states and reaffirms that drainage needs to be addressed, the city needs to clear the culvert or what have you, or do we feel comfort knowing that that review will come later? I don't want to be redundant, but I want it to be top of mind. I, I don't know if Jim has thoughts on this, and if he does, I hope he'll come down and knock me out of the way. Um, again, I think it's a way to reflect that you've heard the concerns of the neighbors and that it's important. We, as Jim explained, he will be working with operations to put that on their list of things that they need to investigate to figure out if there's something that's clogging that and, and identify if there's a problem. Um, but we're not going to require unless it is told, you know, made a, obviously some kind of a, a requirement for the applicant to do a drainage study when we really don't have all of the information to probably be able to do that at a, at, at a, at a fine level. Um, so I, I think you could obviously identify that the neighbors have concerns and that we, you know, would stress the importance of, you know, maybe a more detailed uh, drainage reports when the if the preliminary plat moves forward to investigate that and maybe that's a way to try to go about it I'm I I, I just want to also be understanding that it is a lot to ask an applicant to go to a final level of an engineering document at a preliminary level and and so I just want to be cognizant of that too so sure. I'm not sure if um, if Jack would uh, be willing to agree to that or not, but that may be one way that you could do it. Again, 
entering into the record the concerns. I think sure. that's obviously something that uh, we can note and that we would carry on to the Planning Commission when we describe the deliberations that you had, or to the City Council that the Planning Commission had. These were the deliberations. This was a concern. Sure. It's either a condition or it wasn't, but they discussed making it a condition. <coughs> um, before we deliberate amongst this, do you have a similar, just as far as wording, go, well, let me, let's, let's keep it to the commission first. Hey, commission. Um, how do we want to word, I'm hearing alignment on a condition around <coughs> barrier fencing, tree buffers. Does anyone want to take a stab at um, providing that language? Uh, Commissioner Kohler. I, I think you said it best a minute ago. You referred to it, referred to it as a robust, a robust landscape buffer. On I guess it would be the north, west, and south sides, and a privacy fence that would be installed at least prior to construction. And, and maybe we could do something uh, similarly vague with the drainage to just say that, um, you know, extensive consideration is given to the existing drainage issues on the site during the plat phase or, or something to that extent. I don't see anyone else chiming in, so we're going to let that lie for a second. How about, um, does the commission, do my peers have any opinions on the need to uh, reinforce the need to address the ownership of this road or this strip of land? Is this something that we should include, or is that not necessary? Commissioner Kohler. I think we should include it. I mean, I think, you know, it sounds like a lot of this stuff will be done through the normal processes anyway, but there's no harm to me, at least in redundancy, and to, again, making it clear to city council that we heard the public, we considered these, and they're, you know, big issues. Okay. No feedback. Okay, then with that, I guess, is there a motion? Does anyone want to make a motion? Uh, so I'll make a motion that we approve PZR 2022-8B um, with three conditions of approval as just discussed. Do we need to go into those further, Jane, or is that adequate? Thanks. We have a motion on the table uh, for approval of PZR 2022-8B with the conditions. Do we have a second? Commissioner Lakach. I'll second that. We have a second from Commissioner Lakach. Um, with that, is there any further discussion? Okay, Jane, can we take a vote? Commissioner Teta. Vice Chairman Goldberg. Aye. Commissioner Kohler. Aye. Commissioner Lukacs. Aye. Commissioner Boone. Aye. Vice Chairman, that passes four to one with uh, Commissioner Teta dissenting. Thanks, Jane. Give me one second to find the paperwork. Okay. Regarding agenda item 6B, Westview Acres Annexation, this item will now be forwarded to City Council for action. If you are unfamiliar with Council procedures and intend to appear before Council, please contact the Planning Division for further information. Um, before everyone runs away, um, I did want to, again, uh, thank the public for coming out. Um, we appreciate your time coming out on a weeknight. Um, we, uh, hopefully you felt heard uh, and considered. Um, but I did want to reinforce what has uh, come up a few times, which is this is not the end. This is the next step. Uh, Don and staff laid out that 
This will then move to city council as soon as October. Uh, and so this is your opportunity to speak again. You have a month or two to uh, submit any uh, formal complaints or uh, proposed language or concerns around who owns land uh, and, and what have you, and then come out again in front of city council uh, and be heard then too. Uh, but thank you. Okay, let's see where that brings us in our agenda. Oh, okay, uh, forgive me, there is, uh, for the next item on the agenda is the final round of public invited to be heard, the final call for public invited to be heard. Um, each speaker would have five minutes to address the commission. Um, if you're interested in speaking to the commission, please come on down now. Uh, please remember to state your name addre and address, and you have five minutes. Jane will manage the timer. Uh, Commission, um, Scott Store, 229 Grant Street. Um, yeah, I'm just going to state a couple of things. I'm. This is all fascinating. You guys really have a lot of uh, um, the ability to affect people's lives and how they live within Longmont, and uh, that was just a fascinating uh, example. Um, let me just read a couple of things. Uh, this is from the uh, municipal code. Residential streets mean those public streets whose primary function is to provide access to the immediate adjacent land used for single family or multifamily purposes. I, again, I'm talking about the property at uh, 1283 3rd Avenue, which is using our residential streets as their parking lot. Um, I, I'm a guy that just goes to work and I come home. And when I can't park in front of my own house or my kids can't park and we're doing the, the shuffle first thing in the morning or late at night because of a uh, uh, commercial property within a residential area that doesn't provide any um, parking for their own patrons, um, it kind of gets me going and it allows me to, you know, get up the will to come here. Um, i read you something else. This is from the, um, it's a downtown parking map. This is, this is what we try to achieve. This is what we're trying to stand for. At the very bottom of this thing, it says, please, please adhere to all street parking restriction signs and take the, um, and that take precedence over the map. Please respect adjacent residential neighborhoods and use commercial streets and lots. The property I'm talking about provides no parking. There is no commercial lots. There is no anything. They're using our residential streets. It goes counter to everything that's written in the municipal code. Um, par parking is obviously an issue. Um, city code, the parking guidelines for a rest restaurant is 12 spaces per 1,000 feet. For a brewery, it's 16 spaces per 1,000 feet. I don't know if you know this address. It's it's a gastropub, call it a brewery, call it a restaurant, whatever. At max, they got four parking spaces, and currently they're seating patrons in those parking spaces. Um, how do we get to this point? Where's the property in question? Um, how do they expand their seating into the four parking spaces? I understand that the overflow of parking into neighborhoods happens during events downtown. You know, my mother lives you know, downtown. She's three blocks away. It's beautiful. What I'm talking about is not an event thing that happens once, twice, three times a month. What I'm talking about is something that happens seven days a week because it's not being provided for by the person making the money. I've lived in my house for 20 years. I've been in the town longer than that. For a commercial enterprise to come in and get approval, if if it is approved in some manner, and I would, I, I'd encourage any of you to communicate with me and talk to me about his expansions and setbacks and uh, all of the violations. But I'm really just concerned about parking in our residential neighborhoods. It should be for the residents of the neighborhood and not used for commercial gain by one component. I live close enough to walk downtown. This business belongs downtown or this business belongs 
at a capacity that it can provide its own parking. I'm not talking about shutting it down. I'm talking about doing what Richard needed to do, which was not expand his seating. And Ava, who has since left the city, is when Richard tried to put a, a patio cover over top of his, his awning, Ava said as much in her, in her statement, which is it's unlikely to get approved because this is going to take away a parking space and your property is already under parked. That's within her letter. If you want me to share it, I can share it. Um, I, I think I'm done. I, I, I really appreciate what you guys are doing. And man, that was difficult, what I just witnessed here tonight. Um, but it, it's not just the future or what's coming in. Some of us have been here for a while. Some of us are off at work while these little things are taking place and approvals are happening and what have you. I'm here at midnight. I got to get up in the morning, probably just like the rest of you, because I'm sure you're not getting paid a lot for this. If you're getting paid at all, I doubt it. It's all volunteer, isn't it? It's awful. I think council's underpaid too. Um, good night. Thank, thank you, Mr. Stewart. Okay, next slide. Uh, um, opening it up for any final public invited to be heard. Thank you. Please state your name and address. Uh, my name is Kimberly Wilms. I live at 1138 Olympia Avenue um, in Unit B. Um, I didn't write down anything formal or notes. Um, I originally went to the Coffee with Council because um, I didn't know where to start with my concerns. Um, but across the street, they're, to my knowledge, they're planning on building um, a big commercial area with um, storefronts, bank, auto place, um, restaurant, drive through whatnot. Um, they've already started removing the prairie dogs. Um, but my concern is it's kind of pointless and it's going to ruin um, the residential area. Um, and from what I've gathered at City with the Council, or the Coffee with the Council, um, that there, the idea with Longmont that they're still trying to keep it a small town feel and community, and I think building something there, I don't know if it's been approved or not. Um, I just know that they did get permission to remove the prairie dogs. I did find that online. Um, but it, it's going to ruin the residential area. We already have a ton of traffic from the preschool and um, daycare in front of us. Um, and parking's an issue when they have events. Um, and uh, it's going to ruin people's quality of life there too with views and everything else and privacy. Um, and I don't know if there's a way to stop it because there's empty storefronts a mile down the road. So I don't, I, it makes no sense to build something else right there that will have no business. Um, there's empty storefronts on the northern side of um, Longmont on Main Street as well. Um, which isn't too far either. But I mean, at 17th and Pay Street, there's an empty grocery store and storefronts. So to allow something to be built makes no sense to me. So that's it. <laughs> I don't know the next steps to try to, to stop this, but so. Sorry, I don't like talking in public. <laughs> I get nervous. That's it. Thank you, Ms. Wilms. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, this isn't uh, the, the public invited to be heard isn't intended to be back and forth, but I wonder if Don Burchette, who knows everything, can help you. Okay, uh, the next item on our agenda is items from the commission. Is there anything from the commission? Uh, after that, from our council representative, um, Wishing uh, Council Member Rodriguez as well. Uh, items from the Planning Director, Glenn Van Nimwigen. Uh, Mr. Anything? Vice Chair, thanks for stepping in this evening. Did a great job. Um, the only thing I wanted to mention is uh, staff is doing a draft of some design guidelines for industrial buildings. It's something that's been missing in our code. Um, we did a quick presentation at Council 
last week and we'll come back to you and show you the same thing and hopefully get your recommendation to move that forward. Um, and I think that's it. Okay, yeah, thanks, Glenn. Uh, back to items from the commission. Uh, Commissioner Kohler. Uh, I guess a couple of the comments tonight got me kind of thinking that there it does seem to be a lot of vacancies in the city, and yet we are building on vacant lots. Is, is there any planning in the city, one, to maybe prevent that or maybe encourage, you know, redevelopment of those sites? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure specifically about what site um, she's talking about, but... Um, it's, it's simpler to build on a vacant lot, so that is what's attracted. And um, actually, the few vacant lots we have in town are very complicated. So somebody feels there's a market um, to build on those sites. Um, I don't know, as far as the chamber, whether they may have a concerted effort to bring in tenants to the retail buildings that are here. Um, but we generally try and push, uh, yeah, reuse of ex existing buildings. Um, that's kind of fits our sustainability model. Um, but uh, I couldn't tell you that we're at X percent vacancy in in retail buildings in the in the town. Don't know what that number is, but we're certainly seeing on uh, North Main too a number of uh, mixed use buildings where they are doing retail below and um, residential above kind of building the residential market that hopefully will bring tenants in am I on a timer too Jane <laughs> Wow uh, but that's that's kind of a key of the North Main strategy is trying to build some density and build some market into um, some of those retail areas that are suffering right now and hopefully bring some tenants back. Glenn, I, I think she was discussing 17th and Pace on the east side, which used to house a Safeway, uh, among others. And uh, yeah, that's, a, that's a struggling shopping center. I don't know if Safeway still owns the property or what's going on there, but um, that could be a little... Yeah. I'm sure it's top of mind for both the chamber, for your developers, but um, for your staff. But uh, I think that's what she was referencing. Okay. That was one of them that was something uh, near Olympia, which is closer to 66. It's being developed. Uh, forgive me. Yeah, I think the vacant... The empty properties are at 17th and Pace on the east side. I suspect she was discussed um, the land that she suggest, mentioned bring, removing the prairie dogs is at 66 and Pace on the yes. southeast side. Yes. Yeah. Um, I think Commissioner Lukacs had something to say. Let me see if I can get that. You got it. I got it? Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Chairman. Um, Mr. Stewart brought up a question about parking. Um, could you tell us um, about parking minimums and parking maximums? Uh, how are they defined? Right. Right. So for a retail building or a restaurant that he's referring to, right. it's a parking maximum. So that number is, um, I think it's three per thousand. They cannot exceed that. But anything below that number is allowed. So only three parking spots. Per thousand square feet. Oh, square Sorry. feet. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Gotcha. Right. So I think that number would have been maybe uh, half a dozen for the business he's talking about. Um, but again, we don't require it. Um, so um, they expanded an outdoor patio, basically. Yeah. Thank you. And yes, you can park in a public right of way. So is, is 3rd Street a residential street, or what kind of street is 3rd? It's a collector road. Collector road. Um, but, yeah, there's so neighborhoods on the north, south, east, and west. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Unless there's anything further, we'll move to adjournment. Thank you.